Yeah, it's a different format. Good evening. The April 20th, 2023 board meeting is has now begun. To Mrs. Medina, would you please take roll call vote? Mr. Ibarra? Present. Mrs. Haro? Mr. Flores? Mr. Fuentes? Present. Mrs. Flores? Present. Ms. Thorin Ojeda? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, renewal of Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Ms. Orloff, would you please lead us in the pledge tonight? There is an interpreter, Cynthia Bueno, available for Spanish-speaking persons wanting assistance. Go ahead. Oh, good. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, Katie, why don't you go ahead? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. No, Ms. Wenner, thank you. Is it on? Do, do I have to turn this to turn theirs on? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Board President. Uh, good evening, all. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Yo soy Cintia Bueno, soy traductora y recepcionista del distrito. Esta noche estaremos proporcionando servicios de intérprete. Si alguien desea escuchar la reunión completamente en español, simultáneamente pueden encontrarme en la mesa trasera donde pueden uh, obtener un dispositivo y escucharla al mismo tiempo. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Item 1.3, adoption of April 20th, 2023 agenda. I'd like a motion, please, to adopt the agenda with the following amendments. Amend closed session item 11.2, personnel, public employee appointment, discipline, dismissal, release, government code 54957. Addition of four certificated coaching, head junior varsity baseball boys, one, head junior varsity football boys, one, Head Varsity Cross Country Co-Ed 1, Varsity Football Assistant Boys 1, Addition of 8 Classified Coaching, Head Junior Varsity Football Boys 1, Head Varsity Football Boys 1, Head Varsity Tennis Co-Ed 1, Junior Varsity Football Assistant Boys 1, Pep Squad Director 1, Varsity Football Assistant 3, Boys 3, Addition of 2 Volunteer Coaching, Baseball Boys 1, Track, Co-Ed 1, Volunteer General 20. Could I have a motion, please? I'll second. <clears throat> I have a motion by Board Member Haro and a second by Mr. Fuentes. Yes. To adopt the agenda as recommended. All those in favor, say aye. aye. All those opposed, nay. Any abstentions? So on a motion by Board Member Haro and a second by Board Member Fuentes on a 7-0 vote, the Board adopted the agenda as recommended. Uh, Mrs. Sandoval arrived at 5-33. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item is our Colton High School uh, presentation. I'd like to invite, I will invite Principal Abbott to introduce the students. <laughs> Good evening, Board President Thorango Ojeda, Superintendent Dr. Branda, Board of Education members, Executive Cabinet, fellow staff, students, and community. Uh, tonight, we would like to present our last showcase of this 22-23 school year, and I would like to introduce our amazing Yellow Jackets, Duke, Rosario, and Aubrey, to present the showcase this evening. Good evening, Board President Thorang Ojeda, members of the board, Superintendent Miranda, Executive Cabinet, and community members. My name is Duke Medina, and I am the ASC president here at Colton High School. I'm Rosario Ornelas, and I'm the junior class secretary at Colton High School. 
I'm Aubrey Gonzalez, and I'm the freshman class president at Colton High School. Okay, so to start off, we held our winter ceremony for semester one recognition in the NPR on February 10th. Over 350 students earned principal's honor roll, 250 students earned honor roll, and top 10 students in each grade level were recognized with a medal for semester one of the 2022-2023 school year. Also, Honor Guard students were recognized for being top 20 juniors and will lead the procession line for the 2023 graduation. Next up, on January 23rd and 24th, Link Crew, ASB, and Renaissance hosted their incoming freshman orientation for Colton Middle School and Jobaca Middle School. This event helped familiarize incoming students with our campus, introduced them to our electives, pathways, clubs, and sports, and gave them a chance to meet some of our students and teachers. Also, ASB held the winter pep rally in the Hubs Gym on February 17th. The rally was arranged around an Aladdin-inspired Arabian Nights theme. The event was a lovely showcase of Colton's winter sports teams, dance team, jazz ensemble, and the school spirit of our graduating class. Highlights of the event included competition cheer performing their CIF qualifying routine, the dance team's lyrical routine to the songs Arabian Nights and Beautiful Liar, and Jazz Ensemble's funky performance of Thomas Newman's Buffalo Head. Here are some more pictures from our wonderful winter rally. Now to recognize our winter sports. For girls soccer, recognition for all leagues San Andreas goes to Samara Barboza and Adeline Moreno. And an honorable mention for girls basketball recognition for Skyline is Savannah Govea. For boys soccer, Yahira Rodriguez earned San Andreas League Offensive MVP. Also in boys soccer, Julian Sobranos, Manuel Alonso, Miguel Marcelo, and Carlos Alberto all earned All League San Andreas. And lastly, in boys basketball, Devin Torres earned recognition for All League Skyline. Then we have our spring sports, which include softball, baseball, swim, boys tennis, and track and field. All of these teams have been working hard and softball will be competing in a game that could lead them to playoffs on Monday. So now moving on with prom fashion show. This event was hosted on March 10th during second period where we displayed a variety of examples of what students should and should not wear at prom. We had 14 student couples and trios to display different dresses and tuxedos to show what to wear. And we had a total of five teachers show what not to wear. During this event, we also revealed this year's theme, which is Old Money, New Memories. Along with this, we also announced this year's prom court. So, for academics. As always, Link Crew conducts freshman follow-ups every first and third Wednesday of the month, with a purpose to help guide the freshmen in their academics or in any other questions they may have. Link Crew also celebrates one freshman for freshman of the month, who displays great achievement in their education and shows pride. Our ROP Heal Pathway led a blood drive on March 9th where all donations go to local hospitals such as Arrowhead, saving the lives of many. In addition, Colton orators competed for top honors at the Lions Club speech competition where one of our very own Colton representatives took first place, leading her to the regionals of Lions speech competition where she took second place. Next up is our Lunar New Year event, where we celebrate the first new moon of a lunar calendar. This year being the year of the rabbit, throughout the day we celebrated using the Chinese dragon, which is a symbol of Chinese culture, and they are believed to bring good luck to people. Next is our Science Fair and Pathways Expo. Student scientists from across the CJUSD came together to participate in the annual Science Fair and Career Pathways Expo. This was held in the Rivera NPR. A total of 75 projects were submitted to this year's Science Fair district-wide. Six of those belonged to Colton High students. Several projects were on display in person, while others were submitted digitally. Judges interviewed students on video conferencing platforms as well. At the same time, Colton High STEAM Welding and Heal Pathways hosted exhibitions in other locations on site for our visitors to enjoy. Club activities. On Tuesday, January 24th, Mr. Craig Martin's special education class enjoyed a period of soccer, football, and volleyball on the Memorial Stadium turf during second period, along with several general education students as a part of Colton High's Possibilities program. 
On January 24th, the same day, the IT department celebrated Matthew in a logo unveiling at the CHS library and awarded him the coveted prize. The competition for designing the department logo was launched on October 12, 2022. All students K-12 were invited to enter the competition. Colton High's assistant principal, Mrs. Durham, shared that around 40 students, 40 students from across the district entered this contest. Starting on January 27th, our eco-friendly club continues to get together after school to clean up our campus and hang out with their friends. The event was organized by eco-friendly club president, Ashley Galvan. She was excited to get the group together and make sure that our campus was clean, especially since there was a lot of wind during the time causing trash to pile up. Our wellness conference. For the annual wellness conference held in the Rivera NPR, our keynote speaker, Brandon Allen, challenged Colton High students to be your own hero. The event hosted by Colton High's Wellness Center and Wellness Club brought in multiple organizations to provide support for our students interested in their own mental wellness. As we all know, CHS holds pride in our ability to highlight solutions for issues across campus and promote positive behavior. That is why we hold PBIS lessons regularly during our advisory periods, which include lessons on marijuana abuse and awareness. Saturday schools. Colon High continues to host successful step-up Saturday school days where students can study or make up attendance. CHS has over 1,600 students attend step-up Saturday schools with students earning attendance credit while they get tutoring or study with fellow peers. On April 6, 2023, the sophomore AVID class held the AVID College Fair during both lunches. This fair put into perspective the reality of college and what the essentials are that you need to get into college. And then here's going to be a list of our upcoming thrilling and exciting events for all of our students here at Colton High School. So I'm just going to read through them for you all. On April 20th, which is today, we're currently hosting our NHS banquet for um, all graduating NHS people. They're going to be receiving their stoles today. Spring rally on April 25th, which is a, this upcoming Tuesday. And that uh, theme is going to be Nickelodeon. Avid stole ceremony on the 26th. Prom 2023 on April 29th, our commitment ceremony on May 1st, an all schools awards ceremony for semester two on May 5th, AP exams during the first two weeks of May, our STEAM club solar boat competition is going to be held around mid-May, senior sunset on May 12th, and yearbook lunch pa party May 12th. Our film festival, which will include student submissions, is going to be on May 16th, senior awards night on May 17th, cap and gown distribution day on May 18th, Grad night on May 19th, where we'll spend the day living it up at Disneyland. Our avid road trip near the end of May, which is really exciting because we haven't had the experience of the road trip in many, like, I would say three years due to COVID. So it's really exciting for our juniors this year. And senior breakfast and graduation walks on May 2nd. And that is all for our presentation. Thank you. That was wonderful. I, I, all the activities that you have at your school, it's like, how do you find time to study? <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful, all the things that you've uh, presented and, and all the uh, all the opportunities that are presented at school. Um, do we have any other comments? Uh, Mr. Ibarra. Okay, thank you. First of all, I'd like to start off by thanking Duke, Rosario, and Omri for your leadership at Cone High School this year. Uh, you have done a wonderful job throughout the year in bringing all the events, the activities, being uh, the leaders that er all the students look up to throughout the year. So I just want to thank you. Also, thank you for bringing all the information to the board and, and sharing a little bit of Cone High School throughout the whole school year. Another thing that I'd like you just to bring up is as we start to identify individuals that receive academic awards, I, I'd like to recommend that uh, we start highlighting them on our marquee in front of the school of Cohen High School. Because I think that being able to showcase the achievements of our students, not only to our student body, but to the whole community to show what they've achieved, I think it would be a wonderful idea. So I, I look toward our, our wonderful principal, Mr. Abbott, to uh, maybe consider doing that as a recommendation 
because I think our students there at Cone High School truly, truly deserve that recognition throughout the year for their hard work and accomplishments. So once again, I just want to wish you all a wonderful rest of the school year. You see how quickly this year went by? I know, so so quickly. And so enjoy your prom. Uh, enjoy your graduations. If you're graduating, your, your grand nights. And uh, look forward to hearing some wonderful things in the future from all three of you. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sibar, anyone else? Mrs. Harrell. I just want to thank you for visiting us uh, during the school year to tell us all the wonderful activities that are happening at Colton High School. I want to thank your activities director for making those all possible with your students because um, you are, like Mr. Ibarra said, you are the leaders. You are the ones who create all the fun for the rest of the students in the school. So thank you for all you do, and I look forward to seeing you at graduation. Thank you, thank you Mrs. Harrell. Any others? Mr. Fuentes. Again, like my colleague said, thank you for coming out. Wow, you guys got a lot to do, don't you? And uh, just want to thank you. I think, Duke, this is your senior year, right? Yes. Man, ready? Yeah. I'm yeah. Excited. How about the ladies? Are you guys juniors or seniors also? Freshmen. Oh my gosh. Freshmen. Guys, let's give them a hand. Freshmen. <laughs> yes. Yes. Freshmen and junior. Okay, well... Freshman, junior, whatever, let's give them a hand anyway. So, uh, you know something, you guys deserve everything that you do. You guys are the leaders at Colton High School and uh, will be the leaders for probably four years uh, uh, for Aubrey there. And uh, I, I, I don't have words to say that. Uh, congratulations to you, Duke, uh, for graduating this year and, and for our junior over here, Rosario, next year, Mija, it's going to be your turn. And in four years, it'll be your turn. So I congratulate each and every one of you for what you guys do. Thank you for bringing this great presentation to us. Always bringing the tunnel out today. Got people to walk through the tunnel. Uh, so that was exciting to do. So I want to congratulate each and every one of you again for everything you've done. And remember, it's all about you and what you make of what you know your future careers are going to be. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Anything else? No. Oh, yeah, this is okay. Flores. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. Um, what I got from your presentation tonight is that you have uh, amazing balance of activities. You know, you have um, the academics, of course, which is very important. Um, but you also um, have the pieces because um, a high school student is more than academics. Right. Um, you are about social, your social life. It's your your wellness, your well being, your your abilities to lead. You're members of clubs. You're a member of an athletic team. So, um, I think Co uh, Colton High School is um, what what I would say exemplary, and it shows what a high school should be like, and what the experience should be. For your for your colleagues, for your students, your fellow students. So uh, I think um, Colton High School has got it together. You have the best of the best. You're a model school, and I congratulate you. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Flores. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to tell all of you that it was our pleasure to come and speak, and I'm really glad that you all enjoyed our presentation. And like I believe Ms. Haro said, we couldn't have done any of this without our wonderful principal, Mr. Abbott, and our activities director, um, Ms. Buzzkirk, and all of the rest of our help from our colleagues that we are in leadership with. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, uh, would you like to come up and please shake our hands? Oh, another one. Great job. Thank you so much. You, you guys did really well. Great job. Thank you, Yes. Oh, I look forward to seeing the both of you girls next year. Thank you. 
Uh, John, can I say something? What? something real quick? Um, I just want to make a, a comment. Uh, our presenter, Duke, up here, is going to UCLA after graduation. So I think that's noteworthy and let's give him the head. So congratulations on that. We will now uh, begin our special presentations. Item 3.1, Introduction of New Management. Would Assistant Superintendent Daly please? There you are. <laughs> He's going to introduce our new employees. Good evening, Board President Thorne Ojeda, Board members, Superintendent Dr. Moreno, and our audience. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce one of our new uh, team, team members for management. Um, this person has taken on the assignment as Human Resources Assistant, um, and her name is Argelia Salcedo. Come on up. So Argelia has um, had an extensive background um, that deals with HR, and um, I'll start with the um, maybe the boring facts. Uh, she, she started off as a clerical sub in uh, Colton Joint Unified School District, where um, she did great work no matter where she was placed. Um, and then she was an office assistant under Pupil Personnel Services. And then one of my fun facts, because this is a place my kids love to go to when they're home in the summer, she was a general manager for Miguel's Junior Restaurant chain for 14 years. And so my kids love the garbage burrito and all that, you know, all that stuff. So uh, I, I love McGill's, but um, but she has four kids. Um, she enjoys camping. Um, she enjoys reading. Um, her comfort drink is coffee. Um, and she starts her morning off with rock music and winds down with her evening with uh, ranchero music. Did I say that right, Spanish? I probably said it wrong. You, it's okay. We work together. You can make fun of me now. But um, but ultimately, um, definitely understand the rock music to start your, your morning off. And so, you know, sometimes you have to, well, I was going to say a Beastie Boys quote, but you know, they do rock and all of that, but I'll, I'll leave that one alone. Um, but ultimately, um, we're so excited to have Arhelia here. Um, when I say that she's a breath of fresh air, that smile you see is every day, all day. And, and we definitely need that, um, not only within HR, but throughout the entire district, because she truly loves, loves working um, with us and, and children. And that's one thing that I try to remind our team is that we're, everything we do is for the kids. And so, um, Arhel, you'd like to give you a moment to say a few words. Okay, well, good evening, Board President Thorin Ojeda, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the audience. I just stand here today just overflowing with gratitude. Gratitude for the experience that CJUSD has brought to me the past 18 months, starting as a general clerical worker, getting to connect with a lot of amazing teams, starting from the sites, from IT, communications, PPS, student services, and of course my HR team and my HR ladies here today with me. So I just wanna say thank you, and of course to my wonderful husband who has been a great, a great cornerstone. <laughs> A great cornerstone. It has been a great cornerstone for me and took the leap of faith with me. So I just want to say thank you. And I look forward to our success together and cheers to HR. Congratulations. Congratulations. And one more round of applause, please. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Mr. Dade. Our next item will be employee recognition. Director Cervantes, would you please come forward? Good evening, Board President Thoring Ojeda, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the audience. HR is honored to congratulate and celebrate our Employees of the Month this evening, and at this time, we would like to recognize and invite them to join us when we call them. 
The first up is classified staff, and our recipient for our classified staff is Mr. Art Ortiz, campus security at Bloomington High School, and honoring him tonight is Ms. Yvette Roman, Bloomington High School principal. Good evening, Board President Thorin Ojeda, uh, board members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the audience. It is my pleasure to um, recognize our campus security officer, Arthur Ortiz, on behalf of John Sachs of the Safety and Security uh, Services Department. Mr. Ortiz is a campus security assigned to Bloomington High School for over eight years. He has an amazing way of working with our students on campus. As campus security, it's important to make sure that our students know that they are safe, but also that um, they know that we enforce the rules and hold them accountable for their behavior. Mr. Ortiz has found a good balance where the students love and respect him, but also know that he will follow up with them for discipline should it be necessary. He regularly speaks with students and goes out of his way to get to know them and understand them, even the repeat offenders, while also allowing them to um, the opportunity to realize the importance of abiding by the rules without making them feel like he is some authority figure to be afraid of. Mr. Ortiz makes himself available to adults on campus as well. For example, BHS Connie Barella, who works in the business office located in the center of campus, is in the position where she can see a lot of student activity from her vantage point. Mrs. Barella states that when she first started at BHS, he told her to reach out whenever security is needed, and he has been um, aiding whenever she observes students loitering, fighting, et cetera, in the area. She would reach out to notify him and he and, or someone else would come right away. Additionally, she has, she has and many others have observed his positive interactions with students, such as seeing him dancing during passing periods and encouraging students to hurry to class, seeing students wave to him as they go by. Um, and alternatively, he has been also uh, been observed rushing to calls for passed out students um, or to save students attempting to jump from the second story ledge, uh, jumped a fence to chase a drug dealer off campus. Just to name a few, Mr. Ortiz can be seen all over campus and is known as Johnny on the spot. As he answers call after call or patrolling the campus, he has the kindest heart for students and staff, has a great disposition and always has a smile on his face. He is well respected by BHS students and staff his safety department colleagues and school and department leadership admire him and his um, ability to support. He sets an excellent example of someone who truly cares about the overall well-being of our students and the school and the district community. It is my pleasure to honor Mr. Arthur Ortiz, and I am very thankful for all that he does to support Bloomington High School and our campus safety. Thank you. Next, we would like to recognize our certificated staff. And our certificated staff is Kelly Van Valkenberg, and she's our CPS for secondary education. And we would like to invite her here and her supporters and family. Honoring her would be Mr. Dr. Eric Mooney, and he's the director of secondary ed. Okay, good evening, Board President Thorin Alheda, members of the Board of Education, Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Miranda, members of Executive Cabinet, our esteemed colleagues, educators, parents, students, and community members of our school district. Today, I am honored to celebrate and acknowledge a remarkable employee whose hard work, dedication, and expertise have greatly contributed to our educational community. Kelly Van Belkenberg has played a critical role in our district, working tirelessly to facilitate the implementation and integration of educational technology, resources, and tools into our secondary schools. Serving as a member of our team, Kelly provides ongoing job embedded professional development for teachers, staff, administration on infusing technology and classroom instruction. Moreover, Kelly has been instrumental in assisting teachers in using technology for assessing student learning, differentiating instru instruction, and providing rigorous, relevant, and engaging learning experience for, for all students. Her contributions don't end there. She has also served as a liaison between school and district technology initiatives, facilitates high quality staff development, and works with staff to address the California Common Core standards. 
diverse student needs and interest, and higher order thinking skills. One of my very first communications from Kelly, besides her telling me that the team stalked my social media when I first got hired, <laughs> was her providing me with a list of eight to 10 professional development events that the EdTech team was hosting for our teachers to support our teachers, and her offering to bring me up to speed on each of those. Kelly has also been a valuable resource to our teacher librarians and their collaboration meetings and helping manage the library needs and staff at our schools. She's a coach, a motivator, and has modeled effective use of technology tools and resources such as Destiny to systematically collect and analyze data to improve instructional practice and maximize student learning. Kelly also oversees assigned projects and pro programs such as the California Young Readers Program and is always willing to help out whenever necessary. She has assisted the School Improvement and Accountability Office in overseeing database subscriptions funded through our LCAP, has assisted school site administrators in preparation and implementation of educational technology plans prior to and during the school year. And during the early days of the pandemic, Kelly made sure there was a seamless transition to one-to-one -one and successful distribution of our um, Chromebooks to our students. Last but not least, Kelly approaches her job with a growth mindset and participates in ongoing professional development related to her responsibilities and maintaining expertise in the field. She serves as a consultant for the San Bernardino County Office of Education supporting library services, which is an added benefit to our district and our school sites. Because of her work, our Colton students have digital access to county library, to the county library through our ClassLink platform on their devices and so much more. A team of eight shared Kelly is always helping, is always willing to help me, and I have asked her a million questions over the years. She is kind, patient, and extremely knowledgeable. We are lucky to have her at CJUSD, and I feel especially fortunate that we are on the same department, in the same department. So I ask you to join me in recognizing and applauding Kelly's remarkable achievements and contributions to our school district and county. She is an invaluable asset to our community and her hard work and dedication have made a significant impact on the quality of education we provide to our students. So thank you, Kelly, for your exemplary service and commitment to our school district. I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm really honored and humbled that one of my peers um, recognized me and for this honor. And I'm so privileged to work with an incredible team from Ed Services and um, especially grateful to work with all the great educators in our district. Thank you. <laughs> What's your name? Nice to meet you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. One more round of applause for Kelly, our certificate employee of the month. For our education partner, um, it is Coach Eric Aubrey at Bloomington High School, and unfortunately, he couldn't be here tonight, but we're going to recognize him next month. Uh, but let's give him a round of applause. Again, HR would like to congratulate our winners tonight, and we encourage our staff members to continue to nominate, and we'll see you next month. Have a great evening. Thank you, Director Cervantes. At this time, uh, item 4.1, public hearing concerning the public disclosure requirements of AB 1200 for the classified salary adjustment for the 22-23 school year. 
open the public hearing. Are there any public comments pertaining to this item? Hearing none, public hearing is closed. Moving on to item 5.1, <clears throat> public comment. For public comment, each speaker will be invited to the podium and should begin by stating his or her name and residing city. Board Bylaw 9323 states that individual speakers shall be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 15 minutes. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. President may take a poll of speakers for or against a particular issue and may ask that additional persons speak only if there's something new to add. Our first, <coughs> excuse me, our first speaker this evening is Katie, Kate Scanata. Katie. Hi. My name is Katie Kanata, and um, I can't hear. Monday, my son was attacked at school by two fellow students, and he was kicked in the face, which resulted in a gash in his forehead. This happened at 1245. I was not called. Um, he told two teachers there was not an incident report. Um, I did not find out until 315 when I picked him up from his after school program. I talked to the principal that day and she said she had no clue what happened to my son and she would talk to her staff in the morning. I went back the next morning, still no incident report was uh, filed and she couldn't tell me why my son did not get sent to the nurse, why I was not notified. And um, the two boys were not suspended and they were let back on the playground with him the next day. I went back today and asked if the staff was talked to about proper protocol or procedures when a child is injured. And she told me she could not discuss that with me. And I just wanted to bring that to your guys' attention that I feel nothing was done. And if any other kid is hurt at school, I feel parents should be notified at that time, especially with a head injury. My son has a really good sized gash on his forehead. It happened at Ritchie Canyon Elementary. The principal's name was Ms. Pedroza. He told a substitute and a third grade teacher named Alexandria Felix. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Ortiz will be following up with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Do I to have some comment real quick? Just a quick, I just like to uh, make sure that the follow up we get addressed uh, as a board on the, on the outcome of this follow up. Thank you. And next person, Jesse Holguin. Good evening, Board President Ojeda, Board Member Superintendent Miranda, and members of the audience. <clears throat> My name is Jesse Olgame. I'm the former baseball coach at Grand Terrace High School. I wanted to bring a I wanted to bring a situation to your attention that occurred on Monday, April 10th, the day before I was let go. After our game, we arrived back at our school, noticed the parents of, of one of my players. After then noticing them, immediately text Mr. Casado, who is our interim athletic director. I made him aware that there might be an issue. He texted back and said he'd be right there, only to have him arrive 20 minutes after. During that time, the parents stormed onto the field, which I feel is my classroom. <clears throat> he began to verbally abuse my players and I, only to have this parent later put his hands on three of my players. I asked the parents multiple times to wait outside the gate until my players were dismissed to have a conversation, but yet he refused.
my concern at that point was the safety of my players and myself. I had a brief uh, verbal altercation with the, with the father, asking him to leave as he continued to verbally attack me, going as far as speaking about my family. The this, this situation was a continuation from something that took place a week prior that our athletic director was notified about. When Mr. Casado arrived, the player and the parent were both in the parking lot where he began to shout out and continue making comments about my players and my family. Rather than this parent being escorted off campus, they were put on the back of a golf cart and taken to the office to take their statement. I was called into the office on Tuesday the 11th at 1.45 and was let go at 2.30, where I was told it was due to multiple issues and not, not about the incident from the previous night. I then asked our principal, had, had last night not happened, would, it, would I be sitting in his office? His answer was probably not. With that being said, I've, had, I've, yet to be, I've yet to have been asked to give a statement about the incident, how me having to protect my kids had to be done alone because of the negligence of our admin. Yet because of the reasons not being disclosed to me, of me being let go, other than multiple reasons, I find very weird that three weeks ago in passing, our principal then pat me on my shoulder and said, keep up the great work. I understand that as a walk-on coach, I have, I have to be rehired every season. And if the school chose to not hire me back, then I would have been able to apply for other jobs without being questioned. But now my integrity has come into question and not just through any future hiring process, but in the community my family lives in. Just this week, I was, it was reported that, our, that one of our players, oh, I'm sorry, that a staff member told one of our players that they, they have Stockholm syndrome. The situation that could have further been prevented from that this just, that could further prevent further employment. I feel this, I feel this all could have been prevented if things were handled properly by administration. I thank you for your time and your service to our community. And I hope to hear from somebody regarding what I've said here tonight. Thank you. Our next speaker, Layla Christian. Hi, my name is Layla. Um, I'm here to talk about what happened um, on the baseball field. I was there also, I seen what happened. And unfortunately, I too, just like Coach Jesse, have not been called to see what happened. My son has been up and down with emotions. You know, the only re so my son is a freshman this year. And um, those that know me knew that we weren't actually gonna stay here. We were planning on moving out of state. Baseball is huge with my, my son. We've spent thousands of dollars and I don't even know how much time with him. And the only reason we stayed was because of Jesse and his program at Grand Terrace High School. Previous to my son being there, I had to pull my daughter out of Grand Terrace High School her freshman year because of the previous administration. Um, so I was kind of apprehensive about it, but knowing that we had a new admin and a new principal, I was okay with it because of Jesse. Um, now he's gone. My son is up and down. We don't know the direction of the program. Um, I was the parent liaison, so I was kind of the middleman for our parents and our the staff and, and our coaches. And I can tell you that it's not just Jesse feeling this way. It's all of us, all of our players. They don't know what to do, but the ones that suffer the most are our seniors. Our seniors have been hit with COVID. They've lost so much time. And what they knew for four years was that coach that was pulled away from them over an incident that should have been prevented and it wasn't. Not only was it not prevented, they kind of put the blame on him without even checking what happened. Now we're left not knowing what we're gonna do for the next three years. My son has three years. You know, um, and it's sad that I just learned 
concern that the kids are being told by different staff members that they they have Stockholm syndrome. It's not Stockholm syndrome. They genuinely love and respect that man. His dedication, hard work, and his program, it, it's like none other. So I, I really hope that you guys look into it because it's not just the coach, it's our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Mary Jo Hartley. Good evening, Board President Thorin Ojeda, Honorable Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the public. Thank you for allowing me time to speak tonight. My name is Mary Jo Hartley. I am a resident of Grand Terrace and here on behalf of West Valley Water District in Rialto. I'm here to, on behalf of the district to formally extend an invitation to you all to our Earth Day celebration and open house this Saturday, April 22nd from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. This event will be held at our headquarters located at 855 West Baseline Road in Rialto. Due to limited parking at our district, the event will be, um, the event parking will be held at Eisenhower High School and we'll be shuttling attendees to and from the event. Our community event is free of charge and will feature family friendly and children activities, informational booths, water treatment tours, landscape workshops, interactive demonstrations, and in and out burgers while supplies last. Uh, while it's not required, we encourage all attendees to register for the event by visiting our, our website, www.wvwd.org. I'd also like to take this time to formally thank the board, superintendent, and district staff for the essential role you have played in supporting our upcoming Earth Day. Not only will Colton Adult School have a booth to engage, educate, and offer resources to our attendees, but the Bloomington High Color Guard will be there under the guidance of Senior Chief Wood, uh, to present colors during our ceremony activities. Uh, we hope to see you all there and thank you again for your time. Thank you. Jessica Jimenez. Good evening. My name is Jessica Jimenez. Um, my son is Chase Navarrete. He is a JP baseball player at Grand Terrace High School. I will also be speaking about the events that happened last week um, in support of Coach Jesse. On April 10th, after the baseball program returned to Grand Terrace High School from playing their games against Rialto, a parent was allowed to enter the field and verbally assault the varsity baseball coach in front of the players, which resulted in physical, physically assaulting players and then was asked then was walked to the office by the athletic director. As a parent of a baseball player, several incidents occurred that day that Grand Terrace should have not allowed. A parent verbally assaulted the coach in front of players, my son included. Behavior like this should never have been allowed in the presence of the AD. That parent was then kindly escorted by the AD inside the campus instead of being removed from the premises of his, for his actions. They were condoned. This is unacceptable to allow this behavior without any consequences put onto this parent. Coach Jesse holds a high standard for his players and expects the utmost respects from them to be executed and in return, they will do the same and he will do the same to them. His reaction that day was, <clears throat> his reaction that day was as a result of protecting his players from an aggressive parent, as anybody would want our coach to do for our players and our children. <clears throat> the parent was a aggressively seeking a reaction from Coach Jesse, and because the players were in protection of their coach, they felt the need to attempt to make the parent leave. They were then stepped in front of, and the parent resulting in the parent physically pushing two players. My son has played baseball in Grand Terrace his whole life. He started in Little League. He's had coaches that have impacted his life greatly in several ways. Um, sorry, <laughs> I'm reading off my phone, but it's making that noise. Um, Coaches are mentors to these players. If investigation was done regarding this event as it should have been done, they would have known that these players respect, admire, and want to be taught by their coach, Jesse. On the field, they learn fundamentals in becoming a man that not all coaches give to the players as coach Jesse does. 
Not only did he do this, but he ran the baseball program in ways that Grand Terrace High School has never supported the baseball program. As an employee for the district as well, I know that there have been vandalism on those Grand Terrace baseball fields several times without any corrections being made and no support from the high school. I know that directly as an employee. As a parent, I know that as well. And I know that Coach Jesse has been the one to correct that, not the schools. Coach Jesse is the one that goes out there and fields the fields, the fields, maintains the fields <laughs> in ways that is supposed to be supported by the district. <clears throat> if he doesn't do it, he has the players do it for them. If investigation would have been further done, we could have gone with the majority of parents, the majority of players, but instead we're forced to go with the minority of what is felt against this coach. I ask that you just please review this incident. Thank you. <clears throat> Next item will be an administrative presentation of the Local Control and Accountability Plan Educational Services Division. Assistant Superintendent Peterson, would you please come forward? Yes. Before we uh, begin the, the report, just want to make a comment on what we heard. Uh, I just want to make sure that if we have a parent who disrupted the program as we're hearing that typically because I've been around for a while anytime we had a parent that would do that we would not allow that parent on site at any ball games uh, period so uh, I'm not familiar and I don't think we are with all what occurred in this situation other than what we've been told but if there's a parent that did disrupt did push our our players that the district would take the opportunity to investigate that because we cannot condone that type of uh from a parent as well so i'm i'm suggesting that we as a district review that investigate that find out who that parent is find out the procedure that our athletic director took during that incident and review if that was proper protocol according to the guidelines of our district and once again if the parent did put hands on any of our players and if that is true like i said i'm it's all i'm just hearing it from eric from from these individuals that that parent should not be allowed to participate be on our campuses or do any of that and we should sanction that person period so uh that's just what i feel as a board member and uh and i'd like to if with the consensus of all the other board members to direct our superintendent to investigate that a little bit further regarding the parent and his actions or their actions i don't know if it's a him or her so and direct that to our president. Do we have consensus for that? Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. Okay. Your turn. You're on. Um, good evening, Board President Thorne Ojeda, Board members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, members of the audience, and members of the community. Um, it's that time of year again uh, for us to present the work of our um, different committees on our local control and accountability plan. It is my honor tonight to co-present with our school improvement and accountability um, director, Joda Murphy. And so um, just as a, a reminder, our, uh, the local control and accountability plan is part of our local control funding formula, and we're required every year to develop, adopt, and update a, update what is our third year of a three-year plan um, using a template, a template adopted by the California Board of Education. And so we have within that a description of our goals. Um, each of the uh, measured uh, metric for each state priority and for any local priorities that have been identified um, through our governing board and through the school district. And so um, each year, the LCAP must include an annual review of the, effect, the effectiveness of the goals, actions, and services from the prior year. And so we're present, here to present that information um, to you tonight. 
Um, just to give you uh, kind of an update as to where we're at in the process, um, our this year's LCAP was approved by the San Bernardino County on August 16, 2022. And at that point, that's when the next year's process um, begins. And so um, along with meeting with all of our different stakeholder groups, uh, we, com we conducted the LCAP survey from October 25th to November 15th and presented the dashboard um, during the February um, 2nd meeting, which gave an update on the metrics and information with regard to the student achievement and the LCAP. And so the final piece of this um, is getting um, feedback from the board, um, the work that's been done, and then now we'll begin to write, after tonight, begin to write the final draft of the LCAP, um, our annual update for next year, um, develop the budget overview for, for parents, the local indicators, and then our summary tables. And those are all due um, June 30th uh, to the county. Um, and then during the month of June, we have, uh, we present along with the district budget, uh, we'll present the, the final LCAP plan to you as well as, and then have the approval during the second board meeting. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Director Murphy to provide some info, just push that a bit forward. Okay, a big part of our LCAP process is seeking input from all of our different groups that are listed here on this slide. As you can see, a big part of this is getting to meet with our different student forum groups from our different high schools. When we talk with them, we want to find out, you know, what is going on well with their school? What is it that they want to improve? Really, what is it that they want to help to make them successful? Another big a group that we talk with is our LCAP parent committee, as well as our different, um, different parent committees. From them, we have them participate in surveys. We have them look at data. We have them participate in, in surveys themselves. Um, and then what we really do is take in the input they have on what, what they want for our students and for our district. And then we have our steering committee that meets both virtually, um, it, I'm sorry, it meets in a hybrid manner. And here we bring them surveys, the results of those surveys, we have them look at data, and then we get, have feedback from them so we can make decisions for our district. Goal number one talks about equitable access for all students. These metrics talk about the AP passage rate, A through G eligibility, and the EL reclassification rate. What we've listed here are up-to-date metrics with most of the metrics coming in at the end of the school year. This is a list of our current items that are funded in the LCAP and Goal 1, and we're going to continue supporting them as we move forward. You can see here that there's numerous uh, areas of staff and areas of support for all of our students, but our focus is always on our English language learners, our foster youth, and our low socioeconomic students. Goal number two focuses on student achievement and centers around our dashboard indicators, as well as our secondary and elementary assessments, which align to the dashboard. You can see up here, our Dibbles and iReady is updated for mid-year with the rest of the dashboard information is included from 2022. And these are our current LCAP funded items to support our student achievement goal. And most items here are specific to teacher and student support for academics and technology. Goal number three is about wellness and the metrics for this goal are focusing on our dashboard areas of the school climate and also all the mental health supports that we have for our students. Um, you can see here, this is always an area of pride, an area of strength when we talk to our different groups. And you can see here our different uh, funded items that we have for wellness. Goal number four is on family and community engagement. And the metrics for this goal include our parent engagement activities with various uh, meetings that we have with our families throughout the district, as well as our different communication avenues. So we're looking here at our workshops, our educational opportunities for our families. Um, only the LCAP survey is updated on here and the rest of the metrics will come in at the end of the year. And you can see here, this is our LCAP funded items for goal number four. Goal number five is our maintenance goal. The maintenance goal covers the areas that we're required to include, which are teacher credentialing, adopting instructional materials, following state standards, and our uh, completion of the pacing guides. And the metrics for the pacing guide is gonna be updated in June. And here are different funding sources for the goal number five. 
Each year, uh, we always have updates or an addition, addition to LCAP, different um, good or different actions and services. And so, because of um, now having because of the changes in the LCAP last year with regard to the budgets and how we spend the money with what's called our um, MPP percentages and things like that, we don't always have the exact amount of funding available until we get closer to the end of the school year with the May revise. And so instead of saying these, these are things we will fund next year, what we, what we have is a list of items that as we have funds that are available, we will fund. And so this year we put them into two categories, one that is uh, personnel and the other that's non-personnel. And so as we, if you remember last year, if you recall, we had an additional 15% add on to our LCAP um, in the concentration grant, which allowed us specifically to hire additional personnel. And so this is, we, we have some additional funding this year um, after the salary adjustments that are made, um, we'll be able to determine um, how, what that exact amount is and how much we're able to um, spend on additional personnel. And so as we go through this, these were the priorities of um, this, the, the, the steering committees, which again, steering committee represents all of the um, subgroups and different um, uh, committees and groups in our in our district and so um, you'll see their music art PE elementary teachers if you remember last year um, we did hire nine itinerant staff to work with our um, nine highest pop highest unduplicated population um, schools and so what we want to do is um, complete this process and be able to hire nine more to be able to service all of our all of our elementary schools in the district um, we have um, dual immersion teacher stipends that we want to be able to provide to our dual immersion teachers uh, with the addition and adding a uh, another subject to our middle school dual immersion program with science so an additional science teacher um, support for um, all of our school sites as well as the district with the website specialist um, a, an additional licensed clinical therapist and if you recall once we hire a licensed clinical therapist there's a lot of interns that come uh, that will be able to support with that so it'll be multiple multiple staff uh, wellness center coordinators at our at our high schools uh, district community liaison right now we currently have two so we'd like to be able to have one additional one to to um, serve each all three cohorts across the district and then increasing our um, child welfare and attendance specialists to a, to a full to a full year and then um, adding um, as we add tk and lower the numbers there as well as the instructional support needed needed at our elementary schools to be able to add uh, bilingual elementary instructional assistance. And so these are the personnel and then this would be either one time funding the list of one time funding or if if we're able to continue the list of items that we would add on. And so on there our te teacher collaboration day. Uh, we currently this year are doing one day without subs, which means it's off contract time. And so we'd like to add an additional day with 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 subs um, so that teachers can um, spend that time collaborating. We have additional funding for athletics. Um, last year's additional funding was one time funding. So um, in order to support that again, uh, we need to add it here. Materials for the art, music and PE elementary teachers that that we're bringing in um, additional funding for site field trips. Um, differentiated assistance support for our target subgroups. Um, we presented on that earlier um, earlier this year with our dashboard. Um, dual immersion materials and support. Uh, we have our district arts plan that we'll hope, hopefully be presenting in May to the board um, to, to, to help support and fund that. Our Chromebook uh, chargers and charging stations, which is an ongoing expense um, each year and throughout the year. Um, additional independent study funding, our new teacher supplies, our district community liaison um, cell phones so that they don't have to use their personal phones as they're out in the community um, doing their work. Um, snacks for testing administration, uh, transcription service for newcomers. And what that is, is um, we hire an outside organization to transcribe and translate their um, transcripts and stuff as they enter our school um, from different languages. And then subs for our library library text so that when library texts are absent that we have the ability to have substitutes in the library so we don't have to close down the library and so in closing just want to um, state this year is the third year or this next year's lcap will be the third final year of the three-year l plan lcap plan next year we will be writing our new plan for 2024 to 2027 so most of the major changes if anything will happen 
um, as we go through that process next year, and we will start that um, right away. And um, our steering committee will probably be meeting two times a month next week to be able to do um, the different things. The state, as always, is changing um, the requirements of the LCAP and the different things we have to do. And of course, that always means we're adding more. So, <laughs> so hopefully, it doesn't mean an increase in the number of pages. Um, and then just, you know, we are committed to implementing our LCAP. Uh, this helps us provide the necessary um, support that we need for our students. Um, we have, this is not the only funding that provides that. We have other grants, uh, Title I funds and things like that. But this is a large portion of support, especially with uh, personnel that we're able to support our students with. And then finally, just want to, these are all of the different um, partner groups that help support um, the LCAP and, and the process and just want to um, thank everyone that's involved. I especially want to thank Director Murphy. It's nice to have a partner in this process this year. And so, um, and all the work that she's done in her office with um, working through this, working through the plan this year and and uh, our ability to tag team a lot of this and, and have support with writing this. So, and then want to open it up for any questions or anything the board would like to um, comment or suggest for us before we be in the writing process. Any questions, comments? Mrs. Flores. And, and uh, Joda, thank you also. Um, well, I just want to put in my two cents um, that I feel passionate about, and, and that's the TK3 third grade literacy. Um, um, for our all of our schools, uh, I think that should and and it's very evident that it is one of the highest priorities for us. And um, the men, money allocations are there for for this purpose. Um, first of all, is the professional development that teachers and take TK and thir through third grade receive to improve uh, their instruction. Um, their first best instruction should be, you know, the, the main thing. Um, also, we have uh, three directors. We have a uh, special ed director, Dr. Pearson. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. And uh, um, Dr. Moore and Dr. Hyder, uh, who are very key people because it includes all students. It includes special ed, it includes uh, ELs and includes every single student in kindergarten through third grade, uh, and nobody's going to be left behind. So I appreciate that, uh, the work that they do together. Um, another thing is our classroom should be full of, of overflowing with uh, classroom libraries. Um, I'm, I'm old school, so I, I like having hard copies of, of hard books. Um, I don't know what direction we will be in five years, 10 years. I, I probably won't be here. But but for now, I think it's important that we provide students with, um, with lots of books, lots of books. Um, I love going into classrooms um, throughout the district and walking in and seeing a, a corner of the classroom of, uh, of every classroom with books 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 um it worries me quite frankly um, I, it concerns me when i walk into a first grade class or a second grade class and i look around and i don't see any books where the kids can go and uh, pick a book during their you know when they have time um you know between lessons or, or just for fun. So um, that's a, a minority. Very seldom do I see that. So I just want to make point out that most of our uh, classrooms are full of books where the kids can go. Libraries, the librarians do an amazing job. They make it a, I mean, the libraries are beautiful and inviting and the, the librarians um, are also key people for this. So those are just my, my um, my recommendations, and, and I'm happy to see that LCAP and the the, the SIPSIS um, put money aside so that there's um, a, an abundance of good literature for our students. So those are just my sense. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Other questions or concerns? I have a question. Mr. Ibarra. <clears throat> thank you. First of all, thank you for your presentation. I want to just uh, talk about a line item on a uh, Goal four, where the parent leadership classes is concerned. Um, I know the importance of having our parents involved with their 
students' education. It's it's I mean it's imperative that they become uh, involved in in that way. Um, well, first of all, uh, can you explain a little bit about the the leadership classes? How are they delivered? Uh, when are they offered? Uh, where are they offered? Uh, what type of attendance have we had? Uh, how is it advertised out to the community so that they're aware of it? Okay, so our parent workshops and parent leadership classes are um, developed um, and uh, our, parent, parent, our parent manager, Alejandro De La Torre, um, is the one most responsible for um, putting those together and um, getting getting parents to attend. Um, she works at all of our attends all of our different parent meetings and publicizes that. Uh, we put it out, put information out into out through our Q communication, so it goes to all parents um, at different times. There may be things that are taken home or things that individual sites are then asked to send home as well. Um, many of our sites also hold um, trainings, and so there's a myriad of opportunities for parents to get involved and to do that. We have begun our parent um, professional learning team. Um, so they, um, they've they been going about three months. And so over the course of the next year, we'll see a plan that develops from them as well that will um, um, provide their action plan and what they wanna see um, based off of what the parents state. Um, one of our metrics as we go through this as well is, um, if I can get to that, um, you can kind of see here from last year the workshops invo involvement. Um, we had over 2,000 parents that attended at some point. Uh, most of those were online last year. Um, I'm not sure it's quite that that high this year because of uh, most of us going back in person. Uh, but there's been multiple opportunities for um, parents to to do that, and we can give you a list of what we've offered this year in in BC if uh, or correspondence if you'd like. I'm thinking um, if we could consider taking a look at what would it take to articulate those, those courses, um, putting it together so that we could work together with, say, San Bernardino Valley College as an example, and, and articulate maybe through the adult school program where we can reach out to all the the, the families that are out there that uh, not only would benefit from taking these type of classes, but also will receive college credit for doing that. Uh, and uh, and something that would probably look very good on a resume, on an application, would look some appealing to their uh, potential employers for promotion and advancement, but also identified as something that we can uh, grow from within so that uh, they could also become more knowledgeable about our district, how to uh, uh, work with their own individual children, how to become leaders within our district so that we can not only provide additional assistance to our teachers, our, our employees, to the district, uh, and also that they could walk away with something substantial in, in, in their hands, so to speak. Um, so just wondering if uh, any thoughts, either through Valley College, through uh, CryRop, so, you know, there are you know, opportunities like that, uh, something that uh, will draw in and continued interest, because we could do like a three-tier program, identify uh, the leadership in, 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 so that it's ongoing for educational learning, uh, and, and move it from there. Um, so just throwing it out there. That's something know, we can explore. And, and something and that maybe might draw our, our the interest of our community, the people, because when you think about, about it right now, as you guys well know, I'm not saying anything anybody doesn't know, uh, you know, more education in today's world is better. And when we could provide education at a quality like you're in, you're saying with instructors with materials that reach you know the 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 quality of professionalism why not try to provide additional like, like the the college credit 
uh, a certified program, something that uh, we could run through our, our programs here and then advertise it so that parents can really be interested in getting in there. Not that they're not interested now, but that they'll walk away with something in their hands that will benefit them, benefit their children, and benefit our community and our district as well. So just throwing that out there as a possible, you know, thought. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I just like to uh, reiterate what Mrs. Flores said, and I, you know, when computers and <clears throat> when we were talking about um, our reading program, on words kids are reading and they're doing, um, they're, they have books to go to to read and then they take their test on the computer. I cannot imagine a day when kids don't have books in classrooms. I hope that isn't the future of education, but I sure hope it, it won't be. I won't ever vote for that because we need, I, you know, you can read on here, but there's nothing the same as having a book and holding it in front of a little kid and reading and having them read it and, and identifying that, well, you know, and it's, I just couldn't imagine that. So I don't imagine we'd ever do that, but please don't ever think about it. <laughs> Not necessarily in the plans that I've had, so I agree. Um, but in literacy, math literacy and uh, language literacy or reading literacy, are so important and so to have all the people that she mentioned working together for that um we're not there yet but we're, we're i know you're working towards that but i think we need to really remember that they're never going to get content in upper grades if they don't get reading skills in um primary so it's exciting to me to have pre-k an upcoming I'm teaser for the board we're just finishing up the report from the literacy task force um, it's a very comprehensive report, and so um, that will be coming uh, shortly into your BC, the first draft of that, and then at some point, whether it's towards the end of this year, beginning of next year, we'll get the task force to come up and present on that. So I'll be real happy, right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, anybody else? Thank you, Dr. Peterson and Mrs. Murphy. Next, we have item 6.2, chronic absenteeism and discipline presentation by student services. Assistant Superintendent Ortiz and Christy Padilla will be presenting. Uh, good evening, Board President Thorin Ojeda, members of the board, Dr. Miranda. Uh, pleasure to be here tonight to talk about two topics that are uh, heavily impacting our district and others. Uh, and it's nice to be here alongside with my colleague, Ms. Padilla. I was just about to say next slide, but I got the clicker. So uh, just to give some structure to the to this presentation, uh, the board during a February presentation where Dr. Peterson spoke about uh, differentiated assistance, chronic absenteeism came up. So uh, the slides will address questions that the board had about chronic absenteeism. Uh, and then I will also talk about suspensions and expulsions. And at the end of each of those sections will be an opportunity for questions uh, to give the board that time and opportunity. Uh, just defining chronic absenteeism, uh, the, the state considers 10% or more of the instructional days uh, excessive, and you are chronically absent, which takes us to about 18 days. However, at, at 10, five, eight days, the district is concerned and my team, our team, uh, starts doing their work to make sure that we get students coming to school. The desired outcome as far as being on the date dashboard, uh, they're looking at the lowest percent in the current year that we can possibly obtain, and then a decrease in the year, uh, the, the following year and thereafter. Uh, some important information to consider, this is not reported for high school. Uh, California is required uh, to report on the current year data. So Dr. Peterson talked about only status for 2022 dashboard and students enrolled for 31 days uh, are the ones counted in the calculation. And to provide some context, CJUSD is not unlike any other district in California. A recent report uh, in EdSource looking at 30 districts statewide showed that one third of those students were chronically absent when you looked at all those districts. Prior to the pandemic, they were about 13.5%. Ms. Padilla will give some information of where we've been and where we are now. 
And it's not even just the chronic absenteeism that suffered, uh, suffering with students. It's also the typical ADA, the, the daily average attendance. And you can see there again, based on this report, uh, we're talking about an increase of about nine days missed uh, through, through those 30 districts statewide. One of the questions uh, that the board had in February was just the obstacles. So really two big obstacles that have been the essence of the cause of this. Uh, one was COVID, an unprecedented pandemic that uh, hopefully we never see again and our kids don't have to experience. Uh, but the, the variants, it wasn't just that we went through COVID, you had variants, you had virtual learning. It, it literally put uh, a stop to education and, and the way we educated kids just immediately. Uh, so we've had to un, kind of deal with that uh, put in place independent study, returning to school, virtual learning. But really the big part now is that I, that COVID culture, uh, trying to undo all that kind of mentality and working through. Uh, so looking at symptoms in terms of when we've had symptoms, when COVID first started, there, there was a typical staying at home and following that process, that fear and concern of uh, parents sending their students to school. Uh, that comfort possibly of learning at home. We know that some students, and I speak from experience, my oldest thrived in that environment. Uh, so when we actually started coming back, he was like, what's wrong with staying at home and learning that? Uh, so there are some students that thrived in that environment. It's one of the reasons why we offer independent study now. And, and unfortunately, there is that taking advantage of the system. Instead of staying home for a couple of days, what I normally did now because of COVID, I'm going to stay home for 10 days because that's what guidelines say. So un undoing all that, uh, CHP, CDPH guidance, we've been doing a great job of following their guidance, and it changed recently once again. So working with our staff, we just met, Ms. Padilla, with attendance, clerk, health assistants, and nurses to explain the new guidance and try to start undoing who we sent home, why we sent home, and for how long we sent home and trying to help parents understand that. Uh, in Dr. Peterson's presentation, she talked about, and just a summary of our student groups on the left that are being impacted uh, by chronic absenteeism, and then also two more races, African-American and foster youth, also with suspension rates. So we are having to address uh, those subgroups specifically, which we'll talk about tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Padilla. Good evening. So are we the only district experiencing high levels of chronic absenteeism? I think Dr. Ortiz alluded to the fact that we're not. Prior to COVID, you can see that Colton Joint Unified School District was very similar to our neighboring districts at about 10.9% of students being chronically absent. After the return of in-person instruction in the 21-22 school year, chronic absentee rates were higher than other districts, but Colton Joint Unified School District has been following the CDPH guidelines to ensure safety on our campuses. Currently, our chronic absentee rate as a district is 36% of the at 120 days of school. As far as addressing chronic absenteeism, the Student Services Division is working with positive interventions and incentives to help engage and motivate students like postcards, September awareness, winter incentive giveaways, and our Tomorrow's Leader Celebration event, which is on May 3rd at Bloomington High School this year, and I hope all of you have received your invitations. We also provide personalized outreach to our students and their parents and guardians in an attempt to re-engage students and improve their attendance. This is done by our district community liaisons, behavioral mental health interns, and our county probation officer. To support the school sites with chronic absenteeism, we hold in-person attendance meetings with administration, counselors, attendance techs to look at the data that is broken down by subgroups and then discuss interventions that are being implemented and the ones that should be. Our home visits have been focused to support around our lowest ADA schools this year, which we've concentrated on our five lowest schools, which are all elementary schools and have done home visits with them. One of our Saturday school, also called Saturday Academy, is one of our positive interventions that is provided to students to make up for being absent. Elementary and middle schools are required to hold 12 sessions a year, while high schools are required to hold 16. 
You can see at the top, even though it's small, Colton High School is leading the pack with the most students recovered so far with 1,619. And I know they showcased that in their presentation earlier today, but I wanna remind that all schools can hold Saturday school sessions through May 20th. So SART is usually the first formal meeting regarding attendance. The purpose is to establish a positive relationship with parents and students to provide remedies, remove barriers, and establish the importance of good, regular, daily attendance and clear communication between the parent and the school. That is usually what is lacking. The school sites have held 708 SART meetings so far this year, while Student Services has signed 161 SART contracts while conducting 324 home visits. The district also sends out truancy tracking letters for all students who have three or more unverified, unqualified absences. As of February, we have mailed out 14,492 letters. Mm -hmm. The SARB board is made up of child welfare and attendance personnel, behavioral mental health, dis behavioral mental health interns, district nurse, school administration, uh, San Bernardino County probation officer, and a deputy district attorney from the San Bernardino County. The board looks at each student and family on a case by case situation and provides a plan and a signed contract for the parents and the students to follow. And these contracts will include counseling, interventions, classes, and parent classes. After SARB, our probation officer goes out and visits the students at their school, establishing a rapport, reviewing expectations, and providing gift cards or incentives for students that improve. Students that don't improve continue to be monitored and visited on about a bi-weekly basis. Out of the 49 SARB hearings that have been held this year, 12 students have made excellent or general improvement where they're no longer chronically absent. And I also want to uh, mention that the follow-up visits from those 49 SARB, I mean, there's 74. Uh, when we think about and talk about long-term solutions, uh, really what's important, and we know, and the, the, probably the, the fourth bullet there, is really the enhancement of, of relationships and connections. We know that that has consistently been uh, successful prior to COVID and will continue to be a focus for our district and our division. Um, improving school experiences obviously matters, providing academic support to, to make up for all the learning that has been lost. But getting back to the relationships, Ms. Badia talked about our probation officer. She is amazing. And I want to speak to two incidents that happened with her as she's out there going on these follow-ups, our visits. One, she met with a student and she told the student she'd be back in two weeks to check up on them. For those two weeks, perfect attendance. The problem is she came, she went back four weeks, two weeks later than the two weeks she told him. When she came back to him, he said, I did better, but you said you were going to be here two weeks ago. So what happened? His attendance declined. The other uh, story I want to share that she had is she met with a student who had chronically had poor attendance. She met with the mom to let her know we're going to focus, we're going to help her, her attendance is going to get better. The mom laughed, laughed at her probation officer, not at her. She clarified, she said, you'll never get my daughter to do that. Three weeks later, perfect attendance. And to this day, perfect attendance. And what she recognized when I talked to Ms. Aleman, Lorraine Aleman is a probation officer, it's two students out of how many that we have that are chronically absent. But those two interactions, she says that accountability, the follow-up, that matters to students. And it matters to parents, and that's what we have to get back to, those connections, the parent workshops, providing support, not just to the parents, but to the students, and also undoing that COVID culture of uh, getting everybody back. And th this is where you need to be in supporting them uh, in, in school. So, in, First part of the presentation, any questions? We have 16,000 students, I mean, 1,600 students that are chronically absent, and we've had 49 SARTs, SARBs, I mean. 
Uh, well, I'm trying to go back, uh, Ms. Thorinoeda, to the to the that slide. Um, it's not working. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong the wrong button. I'll let I'll let Ms. Padilla explain that uh, those numbers. So we have 6,600 students that are chronically absent, which means they are at 10% or higher being chronically absent. The first thing that is required before they can have a SARB meeting is to have a SART meeting. I know. So out of the schools, the schools have held 708 SART meetings so far this year. Once they SART a student, they have to start doing school-based interventions before they can be returned to SARB. So once they're at SARB, yes, we've held 49 in-person SARB hearings, which requires us to go out and subpoena families, have to get them at the house, serve a subpoena, and have them come into a hearing. Yes. Okay. It doesn't seem like we've had enough start. I mean, I don't know. We're not seeing the results that we need to see. <clears throat> yeah, it uh, no excuses, Ms. Thorin, but but uh, the, the, the number is overwhelming. So my staff is doing a great job of getting in who they can. You're also talking about uh, referring to parents, families that that they're chronically absent and chances are attendance has been poor to begin with. So trying to get them to attend a SARB meeting is also tricky. So oh, I, I understand that my, it isn't the kids. A lot of times it's not the kids staying home. It's parents just not doing it yeah. and we need to get their attention. Yeah. If I can just add, when you look at uh, the data before the prior year, look at 40 something percent, 44%, we're right now at 36. So uh, so there's been uh, what I'd say you see the the big variance now the difference dropping down and it's continued drop. So uh, yeah, so there's if there's no positive. doors if you're not in first or second grade and you're not learning to read and you by the time you get to sixth grade when we maybe have it together they've lost all those skills. And I'm really concerned about that because this is their future we're talking about. Just like the parents aren't going to get it together. Maybe we need to play hardball. Yeah, and, and I think also, it, absolutely, it, it's a concern, uh, Mr. Ornella, but I think, again, like I said, the, the connections at school and the instruction that we provide, that, that's going to bring them back. It, it, to me, it is a slow process um, getting back to the original 10% where we at prior to COVID. Uh, and it is, like I said, it is not unlike any other district in California. The, the struggle is real. Struggle is real. Uh, Mr. Flores. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. Obviously, this was something that we started discussing um, a little while back, and I appreciate the data because the data is helpful. Um, although I'd like, to, I'm going to ask for for more data if you can present to us in in board correspondence. Um, the data broken down by the various categories that we, when we look at our student populations, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic, EL, et cetera. I, I'm curious to know if we have um, certain populations where it is uh, uh, more of a, a risk or more of a challenge than others. I'm willing to bet probably, because again, that, that data helps us, what I hope get to a point where we're strategic. Uh, it's great that we've got sort of these global approaches with all of the positive outreach and information that is being shared with families across the board. But I really believe to move the needle here uh, I'd like to see us get really focused on um, the the populations that we think are really struggling the most, where I think we can have the biggest impact. So almost working our way backwards, going back to those, to get to a SARB hearing, that's really where every other effort has failed. And it's you're down to really the most serious and severe resort. Now, it sounds like our success rate there is about 24%. You said 12 of the 49, that's 24%. Well, hey, if we got that to 50%, we've doubled the number and we've moved the needle forward. Now, how do we do that? Um, well, we'd have to look at those cases and find out why is it we're not successful with those 49. Um, what is it about the follow-up, the resources, the lack thereof? But I, I'd like to see us get to a point where we're a little more strategic on focusing on those that are really the habitual and chronic and severe uh, offenders. I hate to say, to use that word, but. Um, and more often than not, we find out it's 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 parents and families that are involved. I mean, the little ones, I always say this, in elementary, you can't really blame the kid for being late to school. Um, and I 
you know, take my kids to school pretty regularly along with my wife, but, you know, we see the car screeching, you know, <laughs> 10 minutes after the school bell ring, kids trying to get out. And it's like, you know, mom or dad, if you took a little bit extra time in the morning, and I get it, life happens, it's tough. But this really, uh, the parents have to be held accountable uh, as well. Um, uh, other questions, sorry, I had another question here and it evaded me. Um, can you, you know, this is a little bit new to me in the sense of the details. Can you share more details about that SARB hearing and what are the tools and resources that are at our disposal? A lot of folks are at the table. A, a lot of conversations are had, but what realistically is at our disposal to um, get that parent, that family, and that student ultimately to understand the severity of the case? Yeah, I'll let uh, Ms. Padilla speak to that, uh, Mr. Flores, but getting back to your original question or comment. Um, so we had a county meeting with the differentiated assistance. So uh, what you just referred to is what we're doing is narrowing down per the per subgroup. Um, those students and working and identifying those students and working with the school sites specifically with those students and families. Um, and what we're really doing is those that are on the cusp of uh, really focusing those that we can uh, at this point in the year, because the county meeting happen happened late, is focusing on those really those that are super close uh, and trying to do more prevention. And then still at the same time managing working on those with the increase. So uh, we're there and that's kind of where the focus is, is narrowing down who are we referring to and seeing what we can do. But I'll have her uh, address this. Our and, and, you know, let me just jump in because I, I just remembered my next question, which is this. The question you're about to answer is the question. So I want to end with that. But the other question I had with respect to the data on Saturday school, which is an amazing program. My kids actually enjoy going, and I'm always surprised, this, pleasantly surprised, to see how many kids we have lined up for Saturday school. But what's interesting about the the data you shared is it's it's a little bit all over the place, which is good, meaning it's not schools in one particular area that are doing well over others, which leads me to believe that this probably just comes down to how much effort, energy, and resources the school puts into advertising and making Saturday school fun because honestly that's why my kids like to go it's not like regular school it's fun and um there's really no excuse to not have all of our elementary schools learn from one another so those that are at the top again zimmerman at the top which does very well lincoln towards the top cooley smith crestmore um these are schools that are doing something right and i'd like to see the other schools learn from them the question, Superintendent uh, Dr. Miranda, is can we incentivize our schools? Can we make this fun and a competition? I'm sure you're willing to spare maybe some resources from your superintendent budget to find some way to incentivize our schools and make it fun. Let's let's come up with a fun competition to get those numbers up across the board. So um, I'll throw that out there. But uh, of course, to the, to the question at hand about SARB, please. And just to say about Saturday school, our numbers prior to COVID were fabulous. The numbers now are struggling. The fact that some of our schools are struggling to have 10 students come in on a Saturday is really surprising when that same school prior to COVID would have 125 kids at a session. So it, there is that challenge, definitely. So speaking about SARB, um, so when I speak about the SARB board, yes, there is the D deputy district attorney. That's the one I always say, and she sits right next to me on the panel when we're when we're going over the, the student cases. And then you have our probation officer, a district nurse, our community liaisons who have been out to the house at least once or twice when they're serving the subpoena and then once prior to that. So they have some background knowledge as far as conversations with parents, family dynamics. We always pre-meet to go over uh, the dynamics and the individual individuality of that one case. It's kind of like reading. You have to diagnose what the actual reading issue is. Is it phonics? Is it vocabulary? Is it language? You have to sit there and you have to diagnose it. So in a SARB hearing, all of these members sit down and we try to ask questions. And we could be very intimidating with 16 of us in a room and bringing in a family and they're not feeling very welcomed or wanting to, to discuss personal issues. And so it we have about 45 minutes to speak with each family. Sometimes, um, you know, there's three to six children in a family and we want to start with the greatest offender and, and move backwards. And so it is a challenge for all of us to engage the family, have them feel comfortable and really have them believe we are here to listen 
and then to try to figure out how from this point moving forward can we improve because that's what we're about the past is the past we don't want to go back there but we want to improve and move forward so you asked about the intervention so once we hear the story then all of our heads are, are thinking well what can we provide what can we write down what is the one thing so i'm going to use an example of a, a student um, who wasn't coming to school and didn't like school and he was in a special situation and uh, he shared with us what his long-term goal was which was huge for us him to share with us that he was already thinking what he was going to be when he grow up when he graduates and then um, after that he shared what his favorite class was and who his favorite teacher was so since the school site administrator is right there i pivoted on the school site administrator i said can we come up with an incentive plan that will incentivize him to do so much time on task because the student was a junior and only had five credits he needs 220. so i said can we do something to incentivize him so that he can get goal time with his favorite teacher sitting there and getting time with him if he does so much work in these classes small baby steps right but those are the kind of things that it's exhausting it, it is a very exhausting day when the whole team is sitting in there and we're trying to just rack our brains what do we have available and unfortunately in the current situation our resources have become more limited a lot of our classes that were taught at the county are no longer taught at the county levels and what i'm referring to that is probation is 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 uh, pulling back some of their classes that they can offer right now and some of our parenting classes. So we're we're looking at who can we provide interventions with and what's available and then um, making sure that parents and the families understand we would need you to do this. So one of the common ones is attending Saturday school to start making up attendance, trying to make a strong relationship and having a check in at the school site so that there is a personal bond because I really think it comes down to relationships and kids wanting to be at school. So I know I'm talking a lot up here, but it's it's a complex issue at SARM. I hope I answered some of it. I might as well say what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, I think it's wonderful that we could recoup funds by having Saturday school. But Saturday school isn't school. They're not learning the specific skills at the grade level that they need to be. So we need to really put the focus on every single day at school. Yes, we want to recoup funds because it's really what it does. And it is a fun day. And I think it's important to have, you know, the kids have some way of doing that. But if it's just because they don't come to school when they really will get what they need to meet the standards for that grade level so they're ready the next year. We need to really focus on that. Mr. Fuentes. Just a quick comment, and I think you kind of answered that question. Academically, how many of these students are not going to graduate or pass or anything? I know you shared a, one of an example of a student who only had five credits and stuff, but elementary, middle school, high school, uh, maybe you can just send it to us in correspondence, but uh, my concern is academically, are these students getting, are they doing the homework that needs to be done when they're absent? Are they receiving the work from the teachers? Are some teachers following up with them to find out if they, because I know that I've, I've had, and I'm not picking on anyone, but I've had uh, issues sometimes where teachers will not take work after a certain period of time. So are we working with the teachers to make sure that these students that are chronically absent are able to turn in work that was probably due three months ago? And I know that that's tough, but trying to help these students, uh, you know, come back. And and we've always said it takes a village for to, you know, to work with the student. But I, my concern is, you know, their academics, you know, being absent more than 13 days, 14 days, 15 days. You know what's going to happen to them, and like you know, and I understand. You know, there's opportunities that we give them, but what else can we do to help them? Is there a team? Is there a curriculum? I don't know uh, what can we, what we can do to help these students, and also, and I hate to use this word, and I don't like using it, but educate our parents that it is important that your child be in school. And you know, a lot of these people, you know, when they go through the SARBs or the SART, whatever letter that they receive. A lot of times, a lot of them don't care, but we really, really, really need to push on it. And I, I appreciate the information. I appreciate 
the PowerPoint and what you're doing, but I just want to make sure these students academically are receiving what they need when they're absent. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> and I, un I understand what you're saying. And to add to that, I think, <clears throat> again, if they come back to school, the teacher has just so X amount of time. You got a kid missing 10 days in a year, in a month. And that teacher, every time he comes back, has to find, I mean, they know what they've missed. They show them what they've missed, but they miss the instructional piece so they can do the homework. And that's the hard part. And they miss that piece. So when they get to the next level, the, the next few days, they've missed out and they're lost. Um, so even if you give them the homework and then the accountability, I mean, teachers only have so much, they have, you know, the number of students they have in the classroom and they can't, it's just not feasible to expect them to be able to co give out each day every single thing that each child needs and then because they're not going to get most of it back kids a lot of times don't bring their homework back you give them and so i don't want to put this all on the teachers because i think that's really um a lot to, <laughs> they they tell the kids what they need but if they don't have the instructional piece to go with it they're not going to be able to do it and they're not going to probably get a lot of home help at home to do that so we need to figure out how to get the kids to come to school i guess that's and i'll quit harping but that's just a real soft, uh, it's a real sticky, a sticky place for me to be because I, when you get the kids to come to school, they learn and they feel so good about themselves and they're ready for next year. And the next year's teacher doesn't have such a hard time trying to have that many more kids who aren't ready. I mean, our teachers are working so hard, but it's really, really hard when you get kids promoted who are not ready because um, then they've got another another piece of instruction that they don't have time to provide because they missed it when they're not and they have their own instructional piece to meet that year's standard so it's really hard we need the kids to come to school and we need to figure out a way to make it happen and that's making the parents send those kids to school and taking it seriously um i understand we try to accommodate them in the SARP meeting, SARP meetings but at what point do they just say we just get your kid to school you know, i'm Okay, any other comments? I got it. I got a quick comment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank you for your commitment to the SARP and the hard work that you put together. I understand exactly how difficult this process is and how timely. And of course, as a board, and probably as a district, you know, it doesn't move as quick as we would like to see it move. I understand the dynamics of that. Um, I agree with a lot of my, what my colleagues have said. Uh, I want to uh, just discuss just quickly the, the, the middle schools in our district. Um, and, and I was taking a look at uh, say as an example, Cone Middle School, and, and noticing that uh, the number of sessions versus the number of students recovered, I'm it's really low. Okay, but I'm going to use that as an example. Uh, we as a district have always made it a practice of promoting our students to high school, regardless of what their GPA is regardless of what they whether they go to school or not. And I've mentioned this before, but I see this as us as a district setting up those individual students for failure. Because a high percentage, I mean a high percentage of them will not complete high school without the academic instruction that they require while they're missing school. And I've spoken with our superintendent, and I I've talked to him, and you know, about the fact that maybe we really need to consider not promoting these students if they do not deserve the promotion based on lack of performance. And uh, I know we do it for a variety of different reasons. They're getting too big. They're getting too old. But we have no consequences at middle school. There is no consequences. I could skate through middle school and not do my homework 
and I, I still will be out there with the majority of the students promoting to ninth grade. And they know it, they being the students. That is an example of what uh, Joanne was talking about, about promotion. And it's been ongoing. You know, I've addressed it for many years without any uh, movement on that, that fact. So I know that uh, it's a difficult issue, but I probably would say that the teachers there at Cole Mill School or any of the middle schools would agree. How can we promote students who do not deserve to move on? And maybe that's what it takes. It's hardcore, but it does have teeth in a sense that parents will recognize that at that age. So what does that mean? Students have to be at school. They have to participate. They have to complete their work. They have to do what we expect and what the parents should expect of them. Um, so I'm just throwing that out as a possible uh, co topic of conversation for our cabinet to talk about. Because unless we start doing something that will uh, make a difference in their lives and make them responsible, them being the students responsible and the parents, we're making them responsible for, com for completing what the course requirements require, they're gonna continue just moving on. And we're gonna continue having a thousand students move to high school on graduation day, we're going to have 350. And that's going to be uh, something that we'll continue to see. Now, I know that it's not all because of the chronic absenteeism, but that's a percentage of it. And we really need to. So, you know, I'm just throwing this out again for I don't know how many times, and <laughs> Frank knows, and I've told Jerry. And I told Dennis Bias, I told Dr. Fisher, the same thing. I go way back. So, uh, but we probably need to take a look at something like that to add to our, you know, efforts to do what it's right and get these students to come to school. Make our parents do what's right. Have their kids come to school. Because, like I said, and I'll end it with this, if we continue to do this practice, I think we do our students a disservice as we promote them to high school, and they don't even pass algebra. They take it again. We give them block classes. We're just repeating the same thing over and over, and then they, we lose them. So something to consider. I'm going to throw that out there. Okay, thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Mr. Ibarra. Any other comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's a second Ms. part, Ms. Thornton. Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, no, no, no. Just, uh, just a few more slides. So, uh, suspension and expulsion. So, uh, just real quickly, uh, the, the purpose of suspension and expulsion uh, is, can be a safety uh, issue for us, is making sure that we keep uh, all of our students safe, both the perpetrator and the victims. Uh, but th there's no hiding the fact that it sometimes is a necessary evil. It is a consequence for discipline. Uh, there are two types, discretionary, which is always at the, that discretion of the principal or administration at the school site, but also based on ed code, some of the offenses are uh, do require a mandatory suspension and or expulsion. Uh, for the suspension, uh, the principal, the principal's designee, which is most likely the AP or the superintendent can suspend. There is a process, you know, the due process of making sure that there is an investigation, uh, student understands uh, what they're being suspended for, and then informing the parent that they're, why their child is being suspended. And then expulsion is usually the recommendation uh, of the principal or the superintendent. 
Uh, this slide just shows information as to a uh, uh, few years of suspension. Our rate uh, currently, as of April 12th, we're at 4.5%. Uh, so we are lower than we were last year, and we're hoping that uh, we can maintain that and get back to 2018, 2019. Uh, the next slide is just again a comparison of suspension and expulsions over the last few years. Uh, just want to mention that 2018-2019 uh, and 21-22 are based on four, fourth quarter data, so the complete year. 1920 and 2020, 2022 and 2023 uh, are on third quarter, so you have. Uh, COVID when that happens, so that that data represents up to third quarter, and we are currently in third quarter right now. Um, that also 970 is the number of suspensions, uh, number of students with suspension, not the number of suspensions. So number of suspensions would be higher. And when you look at that 970, the actual uh, ethnic breakdown, uh, you can see uh, black, African American, Hispanic, white, and other. Uh, currently, uh, students with expulsion, as of 412, we are at 13. So uh, way down from last year, which is a victory, although we'd love to get that number down uh, lower than, than 13. Uh, as far as prevention and intervention, our school sites uh, do a great job of PBIS implementation. That's why we have a number of our schools recognized as PBIS schools, uh, which includes expectations assemblies, uh, kindness, bullying prevention, SEL lessons with our counselors, uh, recognitions and incentives. We have our wellness centers, which at this point we have about 3, 000, over 3,000 visits, uh, which is a great thing. Again, getting back to that connection and as Ms. Badia had mentioned, a re-engagement with school and understanding that that support is there. We also have no contact contracts and other means of correction, which uh, help us with those discretionary uh, offenses helping us not get to suspension, but trying to, again, teach and, and, and support. Our division, we provide training, uh, information, and guidance. We have a, a run a kindness campaign that's start, that uh, happens in October, but it continues on through the year. Uh, external training with PBIS, restorative practices, and our counselors are going through Hatchings training to uh, uh, consolidate and kind of coordinate our, our uh, counseling program. Uh, we have a wonderful mental and behavior health department with Mr. Castro, uh, behavior support with Mr. Pearson and his team, and also our uh, security staff does a wonderful job uh, doing what they can to keep uh, students safe and staff. Uh, Long-term solutions, again, things that we need to continue that we know are successful is our Tier 1 PBIS. Uh, prevention as far as bullying, sexual harassment, training and teaching and, and informing our students, uh, but also help uh, with our coordinated school counseling program. We are a district that funds uh, one counselor at each elementary school, which is amazing. We have our behavior mental health program, SEL lessons, and again, security and SRO. So all that relationship building, uh, not just fo focusing on the punishment, but the teaching and the support helps. Uh, also, next steps as far as, again, it's been mentioned here, uh, parents parents are a critical piece to all this. Uh, when, when you think of educating, uh, Mr. Fuentes mentioned the, the whole surrounding the students, the coordinated services, parents are a critical piece, and that shouldn't be overlooked or underestimated. Uh, PBIS, we know that we need to enhance our Tier 2 and Tier 3 uh, because just like uh, uh, attendance, uh, chronic absenteeism, behavior, once we get to the Tier 2s and Tier 3s, that those are the students that need uh, specific support. We do have some counselors and school uh, personnel who are trained in restorative practices, but we know that we need to kind of focus on that and get more folks uh, trained, and then also looking into MTSS training and coordinating our services. So with that, any any questions? Any questions, Mr. Flores? <clears throat> Uh, great. Uh, again, this is this is helpful, and, and the the data is important. Um, suspension expulsion is is interesting because while the numbers are important, they can also be um, a little misleading, and and we want to be cautious that it's not necessarily about driving down the numbers for the sake of lowering the numbers, um, because some districts may do that with the intent of just trying to drive that number down, which means you're you're not suspending, you're not expelling. And that could include valid cases where that's warranted. 
And so this is where we want to find ourselves in a sweet spot where we're working with real interventions to prevent it from getting that point. But we also can't be afraid to utilize those tools if we if we need to. So I, again, I won't speak for my colleagues, but I don't me as a board member, I'm not anti, you know, expulsion or suspension. I would I wouldn't want to see any student suspended or expelled. However, if it's warranted because of the action, the activity, um, whatever has taken place, uh, sometimes we have to do that. So uh, we want to see that number come down, but we want to see it come down if it's genuinely a reduction in, in what's needed. What I do want to point out, though, on um, slide 18 that talks about the breakdown of the, the ethnic groups, what would be helpful here is if we could see this in, in a percentage based on the proportion of that population, because obviously if you look at the whole numbers, Hispanic is far greater than the others, but that, that's 86 or 87 percent of our school population. So if we could get that data again in a way that it's a little, little more comparative, so per, in proportion to that demographic makeup of our school district. What I do know off the top of my head, though, interestingly enough, looking at these numbers, is that our population of white students is just about the same as the African American student population. Actually, it's a little bit less. And yet, the number of suspensions among, amongst black African American students is double that. That's telling. Um, that, that's a problem. Uh, and my guess is the last time we had data broken down, that number is even greater when you look at male, it's specifically male African American black students have a very high, very disproportionate suspension rate. That's a problem. And in a minority majority district where we um, uh, were very diverse in, in one way, but in another way where we're such a majority Hispanic district that we forget there are other demographics that we need to focus on where there are, we're underserved. So again, I'd love to see more of that information and I want to see what uh, we can do to really focus on those um, communities of culture because what we'll find just like we talked about before where it's connection it's community it's it's getting to those families and connecting with them well you can't do that you don't do that in a bubble and culture matters language matters and so being culturally relevant and when we have those conversations and culturally competent when we have those conversations is going to be really important so Thank you. Yeah, agreed. And uh, the in the um, initial slides for uh, when I began, the, the two or more races in African American, we are uh, recognized for differentiated assistance and suspension for those two subgroups, as well as foster youth. So yeah, it's 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 an issue. So, any other questions or comments? Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, uh, moving down to our action session, we have items 7.1 through 7.69. Uh, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> right, I know. Um, <laughs> First of all, is there, we're going to pull 7.2 and 7.3 for separate consideration. Um, is there anyone who would like to has state another item to be considered separately or just those two? Okay, hearing none. So I would like a motion, please, to approve action item 7.1 through 7.69 with the exception of 7.2 and 7.3. Do I have a motion? <laughs> okay, I have a motion by board member Dan Flores. And seconded by board member Fuentes to approve action item 7.1 through 7.69 with the exception of 7.2 and 7.3. I'll call for a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so on a motion by board member Dan Flores and seconded by board member Fuentes, carried on a 7 0 vote. The board approved action item 7.1 through 7.69, with the exception of 7.2 and 7.3. Action item 7.2, I'd like, I'd asking for a motion to approve 7.2. Okay, I have a motion by board member Haro and a second by, was that Flores? Oh, Fuentes, okay. Uh, seconded by board member Fuentes. 
All, the, all those in favor, aye. Opposed? And abstain, I abstain. So on a motion by Board Member Harrow, seconded by Board Member Fuentes, carried a 6-0-1 vote to approve action items 7.2 with myself abstaining. Okay. Action item 7.3. Is there a motion to approve action item 7.3? <laughs> okay, who was first? Uh, who was first? Haro, okay. Um, board member Haro, seconded by Fuentes. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. And abstention. I have a motion by board member Haro, seconded by board member Fuentes. Carried on a 6 0 1 vote to approve action on a 7.3 with board member Sandoval abstaining. Okay. Moving on to 8 points <clears throat> administrative reports. Are there any questions in the board on item 8.1 through 8.8? .8? Any of those? Oh, 8.7. I'm sorry. We have a hearing none. We are at item 8.8, .8, facilities update. Director Chang, would you please come forward and give us your report? <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Board President Thurring, Chair Thurring and Heda, um, Board Member Superintendent Dr. Miranda, member of the audience. Um, I'd like to give uh, Board a quick update on some of the ongoing projects we've been working on. All right, uh, next slide, please. Summer. I do have slides, I promise. <laughs> I was just saying that it's like I was doing that. working on it, There we go. See it better here. I gave up on that. Can't figure out. It's all mine's all weird. My, I need the, the, the old format is gone, and have to use a new one. And it's like I don't know why they do that. All right. It was fine before. Thank you, sir. We're good. <laughs> oh. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, first up, Colton High School Auditorium uh, rigging and seating and replacement. Please do report to the board that we finished the project in the nick of time, right before the uh, the uh, Terrace View Elementary uh, preparation of their uh, wonderful play uh, production. Uh, Annie, I although I didn't get a chance to attend the the play myself, I saw uh, social media posting and some of the setup, and it's truly amazing and, and wonderful. And then I'm just uh, kudos to uh, Ms. Marquez and also parents and students for to be able to put on this wonderful show for the committee and we're happy to be able to, to finish the project in time to support uh, their efforts. Just, all right, uh, next up, Colton High School. Uh, CT Culinary Arts Building. We're currently working on finalizing some of the value engineering with the architect. We're scheduled to, to uh, rebid uh, in May of uh, 2023, uh, hoping we're going to uh, award in, in late June or early July, followed by construction in August. Uh, in addition to value engineering, we're also going to try to do additional um, outreach to contractors so we can get more competition Usually more competition yields uh, better pricing or more competitive pricing. Uh, also, on the bottom half, we're also working uh, with the uh, architect 
on the addition of the Shea Shelter and Modular Toilet Building at, at Grimes Elementary. So we're hoping to submit that to the Division of State Architect for review within the next few weeks. All right. Um, all right. So we also another thing, a couple of other projects we're working on uh, are the uh, Grand Terrace High School, the turf replacement uh, and track uh, resurfacing project. Uh, we've been uh, working with the site, of uh, principal neighbor and his staff, elect director and coach, and looking at different um, systems that are out there and and really working together to to find the uh, the best uh, solution uh, for the. Uh, for the school and our students. Um, so those are just some of the renderings that we've uh, put together. And on the right, uh, just uh, it's, it's not happy hour, but it's actually, there, there are many variables in, in picking, um, you know, the right turf system. And, and one of those is different infill. So there's a lot of products out there, uh, organic infill built besides just the traditional rubber, there are a lot of cool um, uh, components that help with reducing the heat of the uh the the turf and so those all you know many different variables that we were looking into investigating to again to pick the best solution for our our students um grand Terrace high school pool repair so that's in dsa for review uh, as i previously updated the board we submitted that project in december of 2022 trying to get ahead of the code change usually when there's a code cycle change uh, everybody's trying to rush in to, to get the project in before the the new uh, imp, uh, requirements are implemented. So they they're actually quite um, they're in, inundated with the, uh, the the plans. If you imagine from you know all the school districts. So it's taking a little bit longer than we anticipate to uh, to get DSA approval, but we are hoping to get that uh, approval for the uh, next week. So then we can uh, hopefully get commenced bidding and and moving forward with the repair. And also the last project, Grand Terrace High School, uh, auditorium, uh, gym, and cafeteria roofing repair. So the cafeteria roofing is substantially completed. Uh, they're currently working on the auditorium uh, building. It took us a while to get started because all the inclement weather and so forth, they really need to get a good stretch of weather and not expose the roof and, and, and obviously expose to further uh, damages. But we're actually, you know, with a good stretch of weather for the last two weeks, we able to make some good progress or about 40% complete on that, hoping to finish in about another four to five weeks. And also the gymnasium, that's also in progress. And next up, uh, Crestmill Elementary Curb Peel Project, which is working with the contract and site to get the uh, construction started uh, over the uh, um, summer break. Uh, and also the various playground structure at those various campuses. Again, you know, this is uh, usually a lot of these plans are, are taking a lot longer than we anticipate, uh, usually uh, would expect. So, but we did get a Lewis Elementary uh, upper grade level play structure approved uh, earlier this week. So we're hoping to get the uh, other school, school sites approved over the next two, three weeks so we can hopefully get those uh, play structure installed uh, before the uh, start of new school year. Right. Um, something we're also working on. Uh, the um, we're getting gearing up to start construction with the broad uh, approval of these uh, two recent bids. Uh, it's going to allow us to commence the uh, construction for the uh, campus fire alarm upgrade at Ter Grand Terrace Elementary campus, as well as the demolition of the former Lions Club uh, building. So we're excited to get those projects underway as well. All right, and uh, also want to give board a quick update on the professional learning center and boardroom at 900 at East Washington building uh, on the left photo is this technology wall we have in the main training room. We have a couple of technology walls that are dispersed that allow for some breakout session and meeting. And then in the center, just the main training area. Uh, upper right hand corner, it's just uh, they're actually starting uh, some of the tile work, some of the finish work uh, as well. And uh, the bottom right, just some ongoing, uh, some of the mechanical electrical um, systems that are still ongoing. All right, um, I say the, the 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 most fun project uh, for last. So as board uh, and and community aware, we've been uh, kicked off the 
uh, design for the new Zimmerman Elementary uh, recently. And um, wanna thank the staff and, and, and the architect and uh, for working diligently, engaging the community and holding uh, various community meetings. We are about halfway there. Uh, we, we had uh, two community meetings and we got a lot of great discussion and inputs and we have two more to go. And uh, again, I wanna thank the, the board uh, superintendent, a community, and also the staff for attending a meeting and really having those insightful discussions and opportunities and to collaborate to design the new uh, state of art or Zimmerman Elementary. So at this time, I actually like to turn over the presentation to uh, Mr. Brian Linner with DLR Group. So to give the board a little bit more detail on the process, what where we've been and, and what we're uh, the remaining uh, sessions uh, to take place. All right. Turn it over to Brad. Good evening, Board President Thorne Ojeda, board members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the audience. Thanks for being here and for inviting me to come and share this. Um, I, I'm an uh, architect with DLR. Uh, I have tremendous experience. Design schools is pretty much all I do. We call ourselves schoolhouse architects, and I love, uh, you know, it's been really fun to listen to the students the teachers, your staff can tell that you're all very passionate. And so it just makes me more excited to participate with you and, you know, reimagining what schools could be uh, for your new Zimmerman Elementary. Um, so we have a couple of slides. I'll try and run it through it quickly. Uh, we have uh, a, a very uh, transparent and open process that we've been reviewing with your team. Um, we met first with the executive cabinet um, and then we followed up with uh, two recent meetings. The first one was to review planning the planning process talk about goals and then uh, the last session was about facts and needs and then the, the next one uh, is really fun so a special invitation to all of you and members of the audience to to join it's you get to put on your architect hat and uh, start doing some planning yourselves with some of the manipulatives we'll have available uh, following that we'll be uh, carrying forward some uh, of the concepts that the community will put together and refining those a bit more. That'll be happening on May 8th uh, with final and culminating a final board presentation uh, to you on the results of the process and the design on May 18th. So we do uh, have a, a discipline process. You know, when we include your community and your staff, there's a lot of information that comes in. Um, people get concerned like, oh, it's gonna get, you know, difficult to manage, but with our structured process um, to get uh, and give special attention to each of the goals, facts, needs, and concepts. Uh, we're able to get a lot of information, but the best part is we get to develop consensus about all of those items. So the way it works is you can see images of other symposium processes we've led in the past. Uh, the goals, the facts, and the needs, they kind of fuse together into concepts, and then those produce the solutions that will become your school. The ultimate goal is to make sure that when your community sees the final design, they really can see their fingerprints all over the design. So these are some images from the goals session. Had a great time together. Um, you'll notice that there is QR code on the bottom left. Um, if you scan that, it takes you to the goals page and shows you a summary of all the information that we had uh, produced that night. Sure. And uh, I do want to just uh, point out that we do have a website that is going to be the, the database where all, all of the data that we collect will go online and it is easy to translate between English uh, and Spanish as well, because I know that we have a high percentage of Spanish speakers. So that website is uh, ZimmermanRebuild.com. There's a whole, whole multitude of goals, but I'll, one of the ones that I would like to point out is the, the strong sense of campus identity that, you're, uh, that the Zimmerman campus has. Um, it's probably the singular most important thing that everybody's been talking about. There's all sorts of forward thinking goals about, you know, the future of education, about including uh, the community, but really there's a lot of people that want to make sure that the, the special identity of the community is preserved, even as they're transferring campus. So the last session we worked through the needs, uh, we talked through site management, administration, um, common learning areas, and it's just a, a mountain of information that we're still working through right now, uh, but we hope to have that information sorted and published to the website in the next few business days. We also had an opportunity to meet with your ed staff. 
Uh, we had a great time going through a workshop style session talking about uh, the academic side because academics really significantly influence the way that the school goes together and how it's run. Uh, so we we try to uh, get a deep understanding of how that the academic component of the school is structured, and then that translates into some really unusual collaborative spaces that will be more supportive of your academic goals. So the ne next session again is Monday, uh, April 24th. That's our third of uh, four sessions. Um, there's QR codes up on the screen in case you wanted to look at that. And then the last session, session four, is a digital session. Um, and that's to be available to a broader range of people so that they don't have to come in in case there's uh, child care concerns. And that is on um, Monday, May 8th at uh, 5.30 p.m. And that will be an online WebEx. So just, a, just another quick note on that. Um, you know, as Brian mentioned, we have a, a website. It's on the left, www.zimmermanrebuilt.com. So there's a lot of information. Not only does it, do we um, have document some of the meetings and, and information discussed uh, at the various uh, community meetings, we also have survey that we encourage everybody to. We have different survey. We have survey created for students. We have survey created for staff and community members. So I encourage everyone to um, go on the website and fill out information because the more information that we have, the more un better understanding we have what the community needs are, and, and I think ultimately it results in a in in, in a, a project that we can all benefit from. So again, um, feel free to visit the the website and and provide us any of your input. So, and with that, I will open up for uh, any questions and comments on the board. Just a real quick question, Owen, on the uh, for the. Uh... Grand Terrace High School pool. I know you said you haven't gotten approval yet, right? Right, that's okay. correct. Okay. Do you think we'll have it, the, the uh, pool ready for next school year? I mean, at the rate we're going cause with DSA taking, dragging their feet? Yes, uh, we, we actually uh, made a substantial, uh, a good progress. So there's actually just one comment remaining. So we're just waiting for the plan checker to sign off in the final comments. So we're hoping to take place next week okay. and then we can. All right, thanks. Yeah, sure. Anyone else? Uh, just a comment here. From, uh, first of all, thank you for your report, both you gentlemen. And just want to say that uh, uh, when I attended Annie on Thursday, uh, I had a lot of good feedback on the auditorium and how it looked and People were very impressed. I heard my colleague to my left say that the seats were very comfortable, which they were very comfortable. And I just wanted to thank you for your diligence and your dedication and for making that possible and uh, getting it ready just in time. So I just want to say thank you to that. Uh, on a side issue too, uh, to our superintendent, um, I'd like to uh, start uh, maybe discussions uh, regarding uh, aquatic uh, facilities for both Cone High School and Bloomington High School. And uh, I think it's something that we really need to take a look at. And uh, I think it's long deserving and, you know, we need to stop the, the, the pool from on top of the hubs gym and, and bring it down to earth. So uh, uh, just uh, to start talking about it. Because I think that it, you know, we've talked about it, Frank, and I and I think you have a vision for what you would like to see. So you know, I I'd like to start by by mentioning it in the Frank Miranda Aquatic uh, Swimming Pool should uh, start talking about that. Um, so uh, so you could start just at least uh, taking a look at what it would take. Maybe bring that back to the board with the board's consensus. Uh, and so that we can move forward on on taking a look at the possibilities. Uh, okay. Everybody good? Thank you. Mrs. Flores. Okay, um, with the Zimmerman uh, School, um, you know, we're very, very excited about, you know, what the school's going to look like. It's going to be a state of the art. It's going to be, uh, you know, way of the future. Um, is there a plan on how to keep uh, keep ahead of the technology changes. Um, you know, technology is changing every day. Something new is coming. So 
Um, is there a plan on how to stay on top of that so that we're not installing things that are good today, but then in two or three years, it's going to be outdated? So just. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Ms. Uh, Member Flores. We actually asked some one of the comments that, that were um, heard by numerous individuals from from IT staff and, and, and community members and teachers. That's something where we are definitely going to make sure to look at and do what we can. Obviously, we can't. Technology changes so quickly, we can't predict, but we're going to try to, the uh, goal is to try to design a flexibility space that allow to adopt and accommodate a new technology as they evolve the best, to the best ability. So I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah. So a couple other things just to highlight. Um, technology, especially like devices that you uh, acquire for the campus, uh, they're usually outdated the moment that you buy them. So a process that we typically go through, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk through it, is not to actually even specify the equipment until you're ready to like move in and and get to it. So we would typically specify an allowance for uh, you know what we would estimate like all the televisions or the projector screens to cost um, so that you have it bid, but that you don't buy them until the last possible moment. So that way you get the most current technology as you move into the campus. So that's one strategy. I think the other thing that's really important is understanding the relationship of education, uh, you know, the educational process that you go through, uh, how the teachers use technology and making sure that the facilities support those academic models. You know, with COVID, so much of uh, your, your teaching staff was trained on the use of Zoom. Um, and so now uh, we're really impressed with the, the opportunities that, for instance, teachers could begin to flip the classroom and record instruction in the evenings so that they can start to, uh, you know, perhaps work with students and facilitate, uh, you know, active learning in the classroom. And that really wasn't possible, you know, three, four years ago. But now all of our teaching staff has been trained in a technology that enables things like that. And so I think one of the things that's exciting about Zimmerman is that we get the opportunity to think about, well, how has education changed and how does technology relate to uh, how you guys are teaching now. And so if we can design the campuses so that they're collaborative and flexible and can change with those you know, educational modalities, I think you guys are going to be a lot more future proof because you know, the walls have just as much influence on that as the Wi-Fi. And so we want to be focused kind of comprehensively about how technology uh, really impacts your learning. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you for that. And and uh, my my only other comment is uh, with the Lions Club um, the, the dem demolition of the. Um, is it possible to contact the mayor of Grand Terrace uh, throughout the process so that because I'm sure the community is going to go to him and wondering what's going on. So just to keep him updated as to what the process is and timeline and all that. Sure, definitely. We'll Thank, do. You. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Um, when we get further on down the road, um, how much input will the principal and the staff have as the actual layout of things? And how I know when they, I walked into my brand new school, there were things that were like, we wasted our money on that. Because um, no, one, no one asked any questions of the people who are going to be there using it. And I'm wondering if they'll be, have a few staff members and the principal participating in that discussion so that we so it's really workable and usable in the best way and we're not putting our money into something that isn't going to be used is that are they part of that process yeah no definitely definitely principal and in the stakeholder teachers will be part of the process the the visioning process that we have is more kind of like a 10,000 20,000 square foot, uh, foot level so in once we get into more of a, of a in-depth design, as we get more detail, um, they're they're actually um, DLR is actually the same architect that's designing Terrace Hill Middle School, the admin assigns uh, the classroom building addition. So, so the process that I, I you know see myself and participate in, it's very detailed. We do actually um, they do a, a 3D rendering, and we actually even go to the extent where we go to like a room by room. So they we walk through each of the room. And look at each walls and to see so they can visualize um you know three-dimensionally what that space looked like and we actually then you know modify and adjust accordingly so the the, the process is very uh, in-depth and they and we do get feedback from the the stakeholders 
Thank you. Any other questions and comments? All right. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. It's exciting to think about it. <laughs> All right. Um, we are now at item 8.9. ACE update. No comment tonight. Okay. Uh, CSEA, is there anyone from CSEA? Hi, Diane. <clears throat> Good evening, board member, board president Thoring Hayda. Board members, Superintendent Miranda, and members of the audience. My name is Diane Miller. I am here representing CSEA. I'm our Chapter Secretary for Colton 244. I would like to start tonight by saying thank you. Thank you to the board for approving our ne negotiated agreement between CSEA and the Colton Joint Unified School District. We would like to thank Dr. Miranda for his leadership. We would also like to thank Mr. Dade for leading the district's negotiating team with honesty and fairness and our, and our own negotiations team led by Louis Pacheco. Of course, we had times where we didn't see eye to eye, but this is normal. <laughs> but we did reach a deal that benefits our employees, the district, and most importantly, the students that we serve. Because our teams collaborated so well and worked through the obstacles, we believe our relationship has become stronger than it already was. So again, I thank you to everyone that was involved in this entire process, and we look forward to serving our students to the best of our abilities day in and day out. I have just a side note too, I wanted to mentioned just thinking out loud and hearing all the discussions about the attendance and how it can become chronic quickly. And I did have a thought I'd like to share if that's okay. Um, I'm wondering if it would help to have the SART presentation uh, shown at the TK Kinder Orientation. It goes through the slides and it explains the dangers of the missing school it would educate them ahead of time, like front load them. The, the increased likelihood of the student dropping out if they can't read by the time they're in third grade, quickly the problem snowballs. So just a, a thought. Anyway, thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you very much and thank you for your idea. I think it's a great idea. Okay, our, um, we have Mac, is there a Mac update? Then, okay. ROP, Mrs. Howell or Mr. Ibarra? Yes, we did have a ROP meeting. Uh, we have uh, a few highlights uh, and then uh, I won't uh, take them all. So just in case my other colleagues like to chime in. Uh, at Bloomington High School, we uh, do have a a sports and entertainment marketing course that's offered there. And uh, it was made to our attention that two of our students uh, were hired by the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes and entry level positions in the marketing and entertainment section of their, their, uh, their, their program or their company. Also, uh, we continue to have some success with our Cone High School automotive class because uh, we also had two students who were hired by AutoZone and, and they were hired based on their knowledge and uh, of automotive, uh, the automotive industry. And 54 Grand Terrace High School students uh, in the EMR program, earn their FEMA's Incident Command System certifications, which continues to show that many of our students continue to thrive very well through CRYROP and are actually getting certified in areas that will lead them to employment. And uh, 
did you have something you want to say? Okay, I'm going to hand it off to Pat. Um, the uh, two students, former Bloomington High School students, that uh, Mr. Ibarra was said was hired by the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. One is hired um, was hired to lead their promotional team uh, for the Quakes, and the other, who is a 2018 graduate, started working there while going through college as a ticket taker, and who he is now a senior account executive for the Rancho Cucamonga Quakes. Yes. And so I just wanted to say what they were doing. They weren't just, you know, they're not being dressed as the mascot there. You know, they have got some really great jobs. Thanks to cry up. Okay, thank you, Pat. Uh, also, just want to mention really quickly that. Uh, cry Rob continues to support the education of our students. Uh, their arts and animation class, which is highly. Attended has just received 20 new new computers to support their continued uh, animation uh, education there. And at Bloomington High School as well, the criminal justice uh, program student was accepted into the Redlands Emergency Emergency Service Academy. So once again, they continue to offer uh, uh, courses that are leading to uh, hiring and industry hiring that provides, I'm going to say, decent to good good pay and good opportunities for our students. Um, okay, go ahead, Pat. Um, I also I don't like be a re remiss if I did not mention um, we had at our uh, meeting, the last meeting we, we had our virtual enterprise kids present to the Cry Rock family. And um, they were blown away by the kids and how they performed. And um, as we all know, they just uh, in New York, were in New York. And um, although they weren't happy with the results, I mean, they were pretty darn good. They were fourth, uh, fifth, fifth out of a hundred, so nationwide. nationwide. And what they told us was that uh, from being there in the past, others. Uh, other classes they have they get interviewed by people out who are actually ceos of companies from all over the world if they can't physically be there to be interviewed by by these people they had an interviewee from uh hong kong they're from all over the world that interview them who own their own companies and grill these students so to get fifth place that is truly, truly amazing. And those of you who've been to a meeting and you've heard you heard them, you understand why they did what they did. So I just wanted to make sure I brought that up. Well, very good. Thank you. Israel, would you like to add? If I can add in just uh, May 10th, we have the Night of Excellence at the Cryrop uh, location, if you know, out in Redlands. And I want to invite everyone out. Uh, it will start, I think it's at 5 o'clock, correct? I know they've changed the time. So yes. it's at 5 o'clock, the Night of Excellence. And also, if you want to go on to the CryRop uh, Foundation uh, website, we're taking donations. And if you've heard some of the successes that some of our students have had, we'd love for you to donate uh, for these scholarships that we do give out on the Night of Excellence. And uh, a lot of these students take that money and they use it for a variety of things. And, and we know that when you have that extra 100 bucks or $50, even if it's 50 bucks, man, it goes a long way for students that are going on on their careers. So... On behalf of the CryRop uh, Board and the CryRop Foundation, I want to invite each and every one of you out to the Night of Excellence on May 10th at 5 o'clock. And that's all I have. Thank you. Well, thank you, Israel. And I just want to end by saying that if you know of anyone who is currently interested in applying for a position with CryRop, they are hiring for educational assistance and program support specialists. So if you know of any young individual student coming out of college or someone that you might know that might be interested in that type of uh, occupation, there are opportunities there. So with that, thank you, Joanne. I'll send the meeting right back to you. Thank you very much. We are now going to hear the superintendent's communique. All right. Yes, it's going to be really brief this evening. Because my first item, and by the way, uh, good evening, board president, board members, and members of them that uh, wake up, you guys. 
All right. So we already talked about the Zerm Design Symposium, and thank you to uh, Owen, Director Chang, and uh, our friends from DLR, Brian, who do, who've done an outstanding job with the uh, symposium. Uh, and so, I mean, this is an extremely exciting process, uh, and you see some pictures there. Just uh, we spent time talking about the goals, uh, and then uh, this week we talked about the facts, and then you heard about Monday uh, discussing more about the concepts and and manipulatives, and that's going to be fun. I asked them if they could bring some Legos and, you know, start building stuff there. So the meeting is scheduled for, uh, again, uh, April 24th at 530. All of you are invited. It's in Bloomington High School NPR, and we've had a lot of participants. We've had parents, students uh, show up, and, and it's just a great opportunity to get input. Uh, so, again, uh, we just appreciate all the input we can get because we want to build uh, awesome, beautiful, uh, high tech, uh, just a 23rd century school. All right. So next slide. I uh, just want to uh, shout out for tomorrow's leader celebration event that's coming up. I know tonight uh, you heard discussions about attendance. We know the correlation between attendance and student achievement. That's that's it. That's bottom line. So we 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 know that. Uh, and so as the end of the year approaches, uh, there's so many events and many great events, many community events. And this is one of our highlights, the Tomorrow's Leaders celebration. And this celebration acknowledges and honors our students with a really great attendance, behavior, and grades. So it's attendance, behavior, and grades. So students have persevered and they're resilient, who have worked hard to excel in their journey um, to become what we're calling Tomorrow's Leaders. Uh, so the event is at Colton High School this year, uh, May 3rd. So uh, students are going to be placed into an event, or excuse me, so students that attend the event will be placed in a drawing uh, to win electronics, televisions, some really cool televisions, speakers, laptops. I just want to recognize that the scholarships are donated by Inland Valley Insurance, and uh, one student will win the grand prize, which is a new vehicle donated by Rotel Chevrolet. And that, if you haven't been there for that, it is amazing when you, when the kid uh, and the student and the, I mean, one year we had a student who didn't even have a driver's license, but the parents were excited, the students excited. And we're so thankful uh, to Rotolo and uh, for the, that donation and for Inland Valley Insurance. And uh, it's a great event, it's a great night, and we look forward to it. All right. And then last but not least, uh, Seniors, you know, they're going to start, they're going to graduate here pretty soon. And believe it or not, right? I mean, May's coming around end of May and uh, it's exciting time. We're going to start highlighting our amazing graduates. Uh, and we do this, we've been doing this annually for the last couple of years. We're featuring them on our social media feeds. Uh, so it's just awesome to see our graduates and read about their future plans. So we try, we try to highlight as many as we can. Uh, and I love to read about their stories and because they have amazing stories. So uh, and so on behalf of the Board of Education and Executive Cabinet, uh, congratulations to the upcoming graduating seniors in our district. And I that's one, you know, bar none, the graduations are amazing and just look forward to those. Uh, so with that, I will turn it back over to uh, our board president, Ms. Joanne Thornoheda. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miranda. This time we'll start with board member comments. Uh, start with board member Harrell. Um, just very briefly, I'm gonna start with my quote and then I'll say why. One tree can start a forest. One smile can begin a friendship. One hand can lift a soul. One word can frame a goal. One candle can wipe out darkness. One laugh can conquer gloom. One hope can raise our spirits. One touch can show you care. One life can make a difference. Be that one today. The reason I, po I, I picked this quote today is I want, um, first of all, I want to apologize to the sites uh, for not coming out um, as much as I normally do. 
and uh, especially to the Zimmerman community for not being at the first two of the uh, um, planning meetings. I will be at the one on Monday. Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, our superintendent knows and um, several people know that um, I lost my sister this um, last week. And um, my family was my mom and dad and my two brothers and my sister. She was the oldest uh, of all of us. And she was all I had left. There's a 21 year difference between my sister and I. So we didn't always get along. But <laughs> we shared a, a house with my parents. And uh, it was a little 800 square foot house. And my sister and I shared a room. So you can imagine the uh that dynamics it wasn't of a it wasn't a fun dynamics for a young girl getting growing up my sister was a teacher for 35 years in um la unified school district and she was very organized like most teachers are and um i have been busy planning services with my family going into la uh with trying to plan services uh for her um, and saying that she was organized, she planned her whole funeral, uh, and which was kind of, it was good, but it wasn't good because I started looking at some of the demands um, from the type of flower to the color of the flowers on her casket, um, thinking, gosh, you know, what if she had asked for flowers and she passed away in December and those flowers weren't available anymore? What would we do? Um, so it's been a really difficult for me. I mean, it's always difficult when you lose someone, but it was hard because realizing that you're the last person from your family left. But the reason I bring it up and I read that quote is I wanna say thank you to all um, Superintendent Miranda and Joanne for the flowers, um, for all of the kind words, the cards, the um and everyone who's reached out to me i truly truly appreciate it and um because it losing this my last family member made me feel really alone but because that that's it that i have no one else but then i realized i do have someone else i have um friends and of which in the years i've been in this district i have made some wonderful wonderful friends who have reached out uh and i am very blessed for that and i wanted to say thank you to those of you here and to those listening um because i truly truly appreciate all the kind words and i'm like i said I am blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Harrell. <clears throat> Board Member Sandoval. Um, so the school is almost to the end. And um, before it ends, um, my concern all this time has been the safety for the school, um, especially Colton Middle School. Thank you for the student services. Thank you for Dr. Miranda. Um, I know they're working really hard for that safety. The school for me is teaching and learning. Teachers are there to teach, students are there to learn. There's been a lot of, um, I'll, I'll go back. So years ago, um, my one of my kid was in Colton Middle School, was harassed and it was bullied. And when I used to tell her, go to the office, tell them something, person A told her, this is just girl's drama. So she did got jumped. We end up to the hospital because she hurt her head. And some other girls, her friends, they tried to defend her and those girls got suspended. So, so those girls didn't even involve security needed to be there. 
not the other students. Um, this school year, same situation, and with my other kids, and same thing, to go to the office. Person A told her this is just girl's drama. Why do they call it girl's drama? The first time she did that slap, my first daughter, and she got hit on her head. So uh, the parent came today and told about the, her situation in elementary. So it's not even just the middle school, it's different schools, right? And there's have to be something to be done with that because it's not okay for a person that works there tells them it's just gross trauma. It's okay. It's not okay. And then she went to a person B and that person said, stop being a crybaby. It's not okay either. Kids do not feel safe, especially when they get that respond from a person who works at the school. One of my daughters told me, what is the point of me going to the office and tell them when they only tell me it's just gross drama, it's okay. So it's not okay. But I really wanna thank Dr. Miranda and Student Services because they are being on top of it and hopefully next year, <laughs> we do a lot better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandoval. Mrs. Florence. I want to talk a little bit about parent engagement activities that we have in our uh, district. And, um, and to address, uh, Mr. Ibarra mentioned the parent leadership um, that we have in place. Um, I had the, the pleasure of attending uh, um, a parent workshop on April 6th and 7th this month uh, with Simon Silva, who is an um, He's an artist and he's a motivational speaker. And um, it was in this room. And um, it was Alejandra de la Torre and the leadership team that she has together that, that put together this, this whole thing. Um, and they transformed this boardroom. They came in and they set up tables and they, you know, they had tablecloths and they had, I mean, they looked, they had flowers. <laughs> it was transformed. And, and then they were outside and they were um, signing people up and, and coming in and they just, they ran the show. That's what leadership is with our parents. The, the attendance for this, for these two days was over 65 parents day one and over 65 parents day two. And sometimes we say, oh, you know, we invite the parents, but they don't want to come. We invite, but they don't want to come. No, they come. They, that was a proof right there that if you invite the parents, they will come and they are ready. The energy and the, and the enthusiasm in that room was contagious. And it is our job as a district to tap on that. It's not just, you know, Alejandra can't work in isolation and do these activities and then, okay, everybody goes home. No, this, that's the first step. She's uh, helping with the leadership team, bring the parents in. And now it is up to us to tap on that and say, okay, what can we go, where can we go for, grow from here? Uh, what can we do to encourage this con to continue so that it's not just a one-time deal? Um, during this, these two days, um, Simon Silva um, shared his, his artwork. He shared his story. He was a farm worker uh, very in, from a very dysfunctional home. And, um, and he, here he is years later, and he's a very successful artist. Um, he also gave the parents advice on how to encourage the creativity in their children. And, uh, and he said, you know, it is important, math is important, reading is important, however, you need to tap on that creativity for your children. And he did a step further, he also, he gave them activities or, or advice on, on what to do. Um, he also walked them themselves through actual art projects. 
and, and the parents were so into it. It was just very, very rewarding to see and spend the two days with our parents. So, it, you know, it is my hope that, um, that, you know, that's just the beginning and that we continue to tap into that. Um, I want to thank Dr. Ortiz because he came in um, at uh, the second day and, and he shared. It was very genuine and it was very well received. The parents were so grateful that you took from your day to share your story and, um, and to welcome them also. Um, the day, uh, the first day, um, Simon Silva mentioned, I don't know where the comment, where, I don't know if it was part of his presentation or it was just kind of like, he mentioned, oh, I love salsa. So they, um, the next day, they had a salsa contest, contest. They all came and they had a table right here set up and they had all kinds of salsas, you know, different, you know, and they brought the chips and so we're all voting on, on the salsa. So it was just a very, very uh, rewarding day. And the parents um, commented on how this will benefit their students. So uh, I just hope that we can continue activities like this for our parents, because like I said, they will come. It's up to us to keep them coming. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mrs. Harrell. Um, thank you for talking about that. That was a wonderful experience to, to be there. Um, but I just, the one comment he made that to me just, I will never forget was he said at home or at school with your kids, don't just throw away coloring books. Do not give kids a coloring book. Give them a blank piece of paper because that will bring out their creativity. And I just, I was like, how simple, but how so true. So yeah, he was wonderful. Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Fuentes. Thank you, Board President. And on the topic of Simon Silva, we did have him a few years ago when I was still part of the uh, parents. And he did say that, throw away the coloring books and give them a sheet of paper, a pencil, whatever you got, and let them be creative. So we want our students to be creative. And on that, uh, had the opportunity to go to the Annie musical. And if you didn't go, you missed out. Wow. Brand new auditorium. As I walked in, the auditorium smelled brand new. So people were commenting that the seating was comfortable, the lighting was great, the AC was working, everything was to par, and not to mention the musical. I mean, you walked in there and they had some beautiful red curtains, and then at the, at the real top where the speakers are, it said Annie, and man, that stuck out. And if, if you haven't seen the pictures, and I think Owen added a picture on his presentation, it was Phenomenal. We had many students from various uh, elementary schools and from Terrace View, and I know Assistant Principal Coran is here, and uh, he was the one, uh, one of the hosts, and uh, he's making things happen. But you know something, I, back in the day, was uh, an actor for, I was an extra actor for movies, and I, one of them was uh, Saved by the Bell. So if you guys know what Saved by the Bell, back in the day, I, I did extras with my brother for Saved by the Bell. We did a couple HBO specials at the Placita Alvera, and we did a couple things like that. So my brother and I are very avid performing arts. We love to play music too. My brother plays guitar, like I play bass. Both of us play drums, and both of us like to sing. And I was just, wow, just to see the little ones that were there performing, acting, and doing, and singing was just a phenomenal, phenomenal. I wanted it to continue, to be honest with you. I, I got home, I couldn't go to sleep. My adrenaline was so, I was pumped up. I was so pumped up. It was a great, great performance. I know we have some performances coming. I think Friday we have uh, Swan Lake at Bloomington High School. And then next week, I think it's Friday or Saturday, uh, the Disney High School Musical at uh, Grand Terrace High School. But I want to get a consensus from my colleagues. I would like to recognize our performers from all of these musicals that we're having. I'd like to give each and every one of them a certificate from the Board of Education, letting them know how great of a job they did. So I'd like to get that consensus. I do have a list already 
for the ones for the Annie musical. So I got a hit. I'll send them to you, Joanne. But I don't have a list for the Swan Lake and the high school, uh, Disney's high school musical. So if someone can send that to Joanne, please, Joanne Medina. But if I can get that consensus, are we can can we recognize these students with with something? Yes, yes, yes. Okay then, then we're good to go then. That's all I have for this evening. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you everyone had a great uh, spring break. And uh, it's been a long time since we've had a meeting. So it's been about a month and a half or so. So I'll see you guys soon. Have a great weekend. God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. Fuentes. Mr. Danforth. No comment? Mr. Ibarra. Thank you, Joanne. Um, I'd like to add to that, uh, Israel, if you don't mind. Um, I think our, our uh, director did an excellent job and has done an excellent job for many, many years. So I think we also need to recognize uh, Jerry and somehow uh, show her our appreciation for the work and de dedication that she's put into all these performances. So. I'd like to add that as well. Um, I'd like to begin by uh, just uh, looking out at each and every one of you out here. You're our leaders. You're our leadership in this district. And as leaders, it's amazing to, to note that the impact each and every one of you has on our students, our staff, our community on a daily basis. To the point that I probably could say we as a board as uh, are very proud of if what each and every one of you do on a daily basis, what you stand for, and how you lead our, our district toward uh, academic achievement on a daily basis. I'm so, um, how should I say, proud of being part of this board. And part of it, though I know that there's other elements involved, our teachers, our classified, our parent volunteers, et cetera, our leadership, which is you, is, is uh, what makes things go. Your ability to communicate with your staff, making sure that they get the proper information in a timely manner, imperative. Your ability to, to talk and soothe through difficult times, and stand strong as leaders do, very, very important. And what I've seen over the years, you do it with the utmost pride and leading and knowing the positions that each and every one of you hold. There is a tradition here at Cone Joint Unified School District, and the tradition is excellence is pride and it's also you hear the word a lot family and what family means is that we will all work together for the common good of the whole and each and every one of you exhibit that in your own way using your own expertise your knowledge your skills and i just want to say thank you to each and every one of you as this, I was gonna say the season, I'm thinking sports, but as the school year ends and the work that you put in um, will always continue, I just wanna say from, from me, uh, thank you. And from us, I could easily say that we will continue to support each and every one of you as you endeavor in doing the jobs that you chose to do. 
and who you have chose to serve because we are individuals of service. We're not here to be served, we're here to serve. And with that in mind, I, you know, I'm just uh, astonished by what we've been able to accomplish through difficult times. And also, we are here to continue to help you through difficult times. So I just wanna make sure that you understand that. And you know, as you, we all separate and go our own ways and you go to your individual sites, we as a board support you in your individual sites. We support your efforts and what you're trying to accomplish. And I guess what I'm trying to say is if you ever need us, we're here for you. So always, always remember that. And this goes for each and every one of you in what you're trying to accomplish and make Cone Joint Unified School District the best district in Southern California. So with that, uh, I just wanted to make that comment uh, and make sure that each one of you, uh, because I know that, you know, as, as leaders, we oftentimes do not get that little pat in the back. We don't get that word of encouragement because we're the ones offering it. So I just wanted to, and felt that, you know, you as individuals need to hear that not only from me, but I think that I don't have any argument from the rest of the board. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Continue having a good rest of the school year. And uh, I know there's always work to be done, and but we'll plow through it. So with that said, uh, uh, that's, I'm gonna say, I'll hand it over to Joanne. Thank you very much. No, my comments. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for tonight's presentation, Dr. Ortiz, on chronic absenteeism. Um, you know, I went seven, six or seven years straight when I was in elementary, never missing a day of school. And it's, you know, going to school is so important. School was never hard for me because I went to school every day and I learned and I had a mother who made sure we went to school. Um, but, you know, I think about you, you feel so disconnected. I missed two board meetings and, and it was like, he came back today and I thought, I mean, I've done other things, but you just, you don't feel like you quite fit in if you miss things. And with little kids, how can they feel like there's a sense of a community when they don't come to school and they don't learn to develop those friendships? And, you know, COVID didn't help any because they learned how to be afraid of so many things. And so that's part of it. But, but I really, I can't imagine having to go to school and having it be really hard because I've missed so much. And then you get to a point where when you're in high school, and it's like, I can't do this anymore. I quit. And they disappear. And they have no future. And we let that happen. And we can't. Every kid deserves that you have the kind of education I got. Um, to make it possible to, to have a story that you're really proud of and you want to go out and tell and you want to share and you want to see those little faces just light up because it's fun to be there and I learn something and it's exciting. And so I am passionate about that. Um, so thank you for today. And I, I sometimes I probably come on really hard nose and I can be, I mean, I, we had a kid who missed like for school days, and she showed up too in this, my previous, when my very first assignment as an administrator. And I worked with the hard known principal. We had a meeting with that mom, and it was a, what Chuck called it, a come to Jesus meeting. And with that mom, and told her, You get these kids to school, you're going to jail, lady. The next year, both her daughters had perfect attendance, and those kids were different kids at the end of the year. And it was so exciting because they loved coming to school every day. Mom just didn't make them go to school. So um, thank you. And I know you're working hard, and I don't mean to come across like I know I don't think you are, but you get a lot of fire under this, some of these parents and get those kids to school. All right. So thank you. 
Um, I too saw Annie, actually I saw it once and it was so good. I dragged my husband the next day and said, you gotta see this, it's so good. Um, it was beautiful. Yes, the auditorium is gorgeous. Um, and I too thought about that with Jerry. Um, years ago, when I was in Fontana, Jerry's father was, we had a police department there. Jerry's dad was our police chief. And one time I had to call upon him because I had a situation that was really scary and I wanted help. And he saved my bacon that day probably. <laughs> uh, and he was there that night and I missed him. She came up to me and she says, my dad was here. And I thought, oh, I was so sad. I would have loved to see him because he's older than me. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I really like the idea. I appreciate the idea of recognizing her for having these, what did they say, 13? 13 years she's been doing this. And the dedication, when I see those little kids up there, you know, I look and see a hundred children on that stage, and they're all doing what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> and, and they've taken all these precautions to make sure that they're safe every moment they're at that school. That takes an amazing amount of preparation. And she's done that every single year, and I think that deserves a recognition of our board. Um, so I appreciate you saying that. The, um, I don't know if I mentioned, but uh, we, I was able to go on a, a visit with at Grand Terrace Elementary School to see how they're implementing dual immersion. And I was so, I get so excited when I go on a campus, I miss that more than anything, going around kids and seeing what happened, instruction going on in schools. I was so impressed and so delighted to see the teaching going on at that school and the kids so involved and loving to be there. And that's exciting to see little ones that want to be there again. That passion is like, oh, yeah, they want to be here. <laughs> and they're learning and it's exciting because we're giving these kids a future. Um, community cabinet, I think that's one of the best things we've ever done to try to get community involvement to, to really showcase the wonderful things that we're doing in our schools. And there's so many more that we could probably show. But it was, I mean, when I see Mr. Johnson up there from Grand Terrace High School showing his electron and with the kids and the kids got up there, these kids got up there, took the microphone and just went with their program. And it's amazing to me what kids can do now. I couldn't do any of the things that they could do. I still can't, but I'm a lot older than they are. Um, but the, that just shows the quality of instruction kids are getting today. And they're very, very, very fortunate. And we're giving, a lot of these kids are gonna be headed for a school and wonderful jobs that pay them a good living to have a future. And I'm, I'm excited to be part of a school district that sees the value in that. And the last thing I wanna talk about is Grand Terrace High School Senior Inspiration Dinner. That is one of the most beautiful things that a parent can share with their child at school. Um, and it's very touching and yet, I get very weepy because it's that just that one time when that when you and your child are the most important thing happening that day and you go to this dinner and it's all about them graduating, the relationship with that parent and that child, there's nothing better that that a parent can experience. And if they left that room and didn't feel that way, it's their fault <laughs> because it's wonderful. And I know they do that the other high schools, I just happen to have gone to that one. But um, what a wonderful opportunity for parents to share such a wonderful time of life with their kids. Because when they go off to college or they go off and start their future, things change, the dynamics change. Maybe you get closer, but sometimes you don't see them that much. And it's kind of hard. So thank you. I made up for all the times that I didn't talk to one of my comments, but... Um, Thank you. Before entering closed session, the board will observe a moment of silence in honor of our school district nutrition services lead, Karen Taylor, who recently passed away. Please join me in a moment of silence. The board will now adjourn into closed session to discuss the items listed on the closed session agenda.
Well, we don't know how to handle a closed session when it's so short. <laughs> we keep talking out here. All right, um, we're back in session. We're at item 12.1, student discipline. There was one student discipline item presented in closed session. Is there a motion to uphold the expulsion order as presented? Okay, <clears throat> I have a motion by board member uh, Bertha Flores and a second by board member F uh, Fuentes to uphold the expulsion order as presented. Uh, all those in favor, aye. All those opposed, nay. Any abstentions? So on a motion by board member Bertha Flores and seconded by board member Fuentes, carried on a 7-0 vote. Uh, <clears throat> the board upheld the expulsion of order of one student discipline item as presented. Item 12.12, .12, uh, personnel public employee appointment. This, I'm sorry? The student number. The oh, I'm sorry, Joanne. I'm sorry. 1089122. Okay. And a motion by board member Dan Flores, seconded by board member. Um, Bertha Flores and carried on a 7 0 vote. Uh, the board approved the following. Do you need to read them all, Joanne? The oh, the heading certificated coaching four, classified coaching eight, volunteer coaching two, certificated regular staff one, and volunteer general 20. Okay. And with <clears throat> that we're going to adjourn in the memory of Nutrition Services lead Karen Taylor. Good night. <laughs>